Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to the Combating COVID-19 conference. Um, we're just making a, a last uh, minute checkout. We are starting streaming live on YouTube, so please bear with me. Uh, we have to invite the panelists to the, our main speaker to the room, sorry, uh, Robert. Uh, while we warm up, please uh, get a cup of coffee or a soda, whatever you want, and we're with you in five minutes.
Okay, hello everyone. Thank you very much for waiting. This is uh, David Cuartillas, co-founder of Arduino. And I'm here today both at uh, And so I'm here today, both as the co-founder of Arduino, of course, but also as a very concerned human being about what's going on in the world because uh, of the current COVID disease. And uh, I'm actually just making a final test <laughs> before we can go live completely left because there is a strange echo <laughs> coming back after I speak. And uh, we just want to make sure that this session is pleasurable for everybody and that there is no problems when transmitting. So now uh, I want to welcome you all to this session. Uh, as you see right now, uh, we have the agenda online and in this agenda, we're basically showing how it's gonna happen in the next couple of hours. Uh, we're gonna first, gonna be in this plenary session. We will be presenting the uh, an introduction to what Arduino is doing and the Arduino community is looking into. Also, uh, after me, we have invited Robert Reed to make a speech called Open Source Hardware for the Emergency. He's been making a very well-known study right now about 16 tools for ventilation. Um, that I think almost everybody in this call has read already, but I think it's great to have the author to come and speak and present his views on the topic. Directly after that, we're going to cut the room into two different parallel tracks. On the room number one, we will be talking about Arduino compatible ventilators. And room number two, we will talk about other Arduino compatible medical devices. Uh, in the agenda, you will find the links uh, to each one of the rooms. Room number one will be this one we are in at right now. Room number two will be hosted by Alessandro Ranellucci, one of the Arduino makers community leads, or the Arduino community lead, actually. <laughs> and after that, at seven, we'll start a second session. We will be looking at the legal and technological challenges. And in that session, I will be hosting the first one, Legal and Certification Challenges. And the second one that will again be led by Alessandro Anelucci will feature uh, Dario Penisi, who is Arduino's lead of uh, hardware and firmware development, who is uh, gonna be talking about what Arduino in this uh, field can do for you. For the sessions, we have invited a whole bunch of players from all over the world. And we are really glad uh, about the uh, great attendance that uh, has uh, emerged in like no time. <clears throat> so we're first gonna start with this plenary introductory session and I will just briefly make the pitch of why Arduino is relevant in this situation. And then I will open the floor for Robert. So the world is facing this unprecedented crisis. You know, uh, everything has changed in the last couple of months. We've, we've gone from having planned a lot of things, from being able to planning what we're gonna do tomorrow to planning whether we're gonna eat somewhere or whether we're gonna be doing whatever in summertime. And all of those things have been thrown into the trash can and we'll be forced to rewrite our everyday life from scratch again. As of today, COVID-19 has been diagnosed to almost 1 million people. And we know this is just the tip of the iceberg because many countries are not even doing the proper testing. And I'm living at one of those, by the way. This disease has managed to put the whole world into a recession, both economically, but also I would say emotional recession. People are trapped. They don't know exactly what to do. They don't know how to react. And I think everybody is emotionally touched by the situation. In a sense, COVID-19 has stopped our life as we know it. So who doesn't want to help under these circumstances? Who doesn't want to be doing something for your neighbors, for people in your community, people out there, anybody? So uh, we also want to help, but there's challenges. 
as technologies, the challenges we face is that uh, designing first ventilators to any kind of other tools, uh, they have to be done in record time because we're fighting against something we didn't know how it worked before. So now we have to work with something that even is forcing us to work on distance from one another and distance is actually making things very difficult. We have to work getting access to hardware resources worldwide during a lockdown. It's really hard to transport things from A to B, really hard to source materials, and really hard to manufacture things in the way we were doing just a, barely a month ago. And we're also facing legal regulation limitations. Of course, our governments want to do the best for us, and they want to take care of our health. And therefore, there is regulations that are making very complicated for many of us to join the discussion about which tools could be convenient to fight against COVID-19. So the Arduino community stands up to the challenge. We've seen plenty of projects from you know, teenagers doing uh, motor controlled uh, soap dispensers to teams of uh, university researchers and doctors working in making uh, life-saving respirators for inter-scale units. So we want to join this conversation. And we've been working in the shadows for the last two or three weeks, helping different groups, giving advice, and eventually even donating some materials. So we've been asking ourselves what we as Arduino can do in this situation. First of all, we think that the open hardware community of which Arduino is part of is in the position of contributing by offering a great technical know-how to groups and individuals that are in advanced phases of projects. I mean, I don't want to sound uh, bad about this, but of course we need to give priority to those that are closer to an end because time is at the essence. We can also give great supply chain advice to those willing to move beyond the prototype level and into production. We at Arduino have make, are making thousands of boards on a day-to-day -day basis, and we've managed to make our systems classify for medical supplies, which means we're in a situation where we can help you think about how you want to build your things. But it's very important to think about which kind of processors you want to use, which kind of boards you're interested in using, and which kind of software you're writing. Because if everybody trying to scale using the same tools, it might be facing a problem from the supply chain worldwide. And also we want to help out throughout this distributed delivery channels. As you know, we are partnering with a lot of companies like the largest hardware um, uh, resellers in the world. And all of them are really willing to help together with us in helping you getting things done in record time. So we're here to join forces with you against uh, COVID-19. So this was my introduction, but before we move on into the next session with Robert Reed, I want to remind you that uh, Arduino being one of the most distributed uh, hardware piece in the world has of course inspired a lot of people, but also has put everybody in front of using the same piece of technology in a way. So we have to think about how to diversify our efforts and it will be very important if you thought about which are the main features you want for your designs and how you would like to uh, move on from here and on and think about what is best for you, best for your work, best for your team, but also best when thinking about scaling. And I really want to invite you to have this conversation with Dario Penisi. I would invite all of the ventilator groups to have one person in the legal track, or also one person in the technology track during the last uh, sessions. And that said, I will stop sharing my screen and open the floor for Robert, who is going to be delivering his lecture, Open Source Hardware for the Emergency. So give a virtual hands up for him and uh, let's open the floor. I unfortunately can only speak to one thing which I've been focusing on, which is ventilators. And I'm, I'm going to talk uh, about ventilators. This title slide probably should mention ventilators. Uh, I um, 
run a charity in the United States called Public Invention, and most of my work in the last two or three weeks has been within coronavirus.org. The Arduino is popular. Uh, probably 80% of the open source ventilator projects use Arduino. Um, the only really buildable one that I'm aware of right now, the Ambo vent uses a Nano. Um, yesterday, Medtronics open source a lot of their uh, stuff. It uses a PIC. Um, I've been keeping track of as best I can of all of the, the efforts. Uh, I have a spreadsheet here with a lot of different efforts. Most of the ones which use a microcontroller at all, not all of them do, uh, use an Arduino. So uh, the question is, what should the Arduino community do with respect to ventilators to try to help? And I think they should do what they always do, build libraries, hardware modules, tutorials, protocols, and standards. Um, fundamentally, the problem of ventilators is to control air. It seems very simple, but that's the truth. But the pressure, flow, and volume must be controlled very precisely. It is a fact that the uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, which is the primary thing which kills you if you have COVID-19, requires um, very careful control of pressure and volume. If you blow too much air into the lungs or you blow too hard or you blow too quickly, you damage the lungs. And these are people who are paralyzed and helpless when they're intubated. So any mistake can be a fatality. And a software bug in Arduino code here could lead to a fatality. So Arduino can be the heart of a modular ventilator architecture platform. Commercial ventilators had little reason to be modular and open. They were selling uh, devices for more than $25,000 and they specifically didn't want to um, do that, uh, make it modular. Their systems are highly optimized and um, no doubt they were very good at what they did. But a modular architecture would allow us to deal with supply chain disruptions. Now, you might think it's impossible to do that in this case, but in actuality, almost all ventilators are, they're fairly simple devices. Um, I have attempted to create this abstract model of a ventilator, and I, I, I'm sure David wants me to go fast, so I can't talk about it too much, but basically ventilators are not that complicated, there aren't that many components. There are only so many places where you can measure pressure, for example. And so in a sense, uh, one of my friends, Naram Pushin, talked about the, the robotic operating system. We could build sort of a ventilator operating system, uh, which could modularize this whole effort. So what should the Arduino community do? It should build libraries to control air, hardware modules, printed circuit boards and sensors to control air tutorials to control air, and protocols and standards related to this specialty, which is, is very similar to what is always done. So I, I wanna throw out some ideas. Uh, I'm not an expert, uh, I'm, and I'm not an electrical engineer, by the way, um, but these are, are things that, ways in which we could share as a community without decreasing our diversity. We could have multiple solutions to these problems. From a software point of view, we need online, on the Arduino, but online, I use online in the old community sense, not as on the internet, but uh, a, a algorithm which can process data as it comes in uh, 100 times a second. It can process a new pressure and flow sample. And the nice thing about this domain is you really don't have to sample more than 100 hertz, I, I think. You don't have to deal with enormous quantities of data, but we need breath standards. And we also need test software for sophisticated burn-ins. So um, this is a screenshot I took uh, this morning of the Ventmon system that I'm working on. It just shows that when you deal with ventilators, you're dealing with flow, volume, and pressure curves. We need a standard way to interchange and talk about flow, volume, and pressure curves, and also oxygen, hydrogen, and other kinds of events, so that one team could build a test or analysis system while another team is building a data collection system. The Arduino community has already done this. We're, we're very used to creating standards which allow interchange of data. We just need to now make ventilator specific standards. If 
we're going to talk about ventilators. There are many ways an Arduino could be used for something that's not an Arduino, a ventilator, but uh, I can't speak to that. So we also need modularization of hardware, modular air control, by which I mean you can provide the force to push air into someone's lungs in different ways. You can use a pump, you can squeeze a bag, you can use a motor, you can use a fan, you can use compressed air, but all of them have to be controlled in some way. If we had modular air control, you could change that. And ideally it wouldn't matter if you were using a pump or compressed air. We particularly need a flow analyzer, ventilator tester, ventilator monitor. And I've created a project to work on that the basic issue here is because these are life critical systems, they're always monitored in a critical care situation. In a, in a well-functioning hospital, telemetry sends information to a nurse's station. If something goes wrong, it beeps or you know alarms and screams at them and the nurse can go change something. It's even more important when we are making um, uh, machines which had not gone through a lengthy qualification uh, quality assurance process that we have that kind of monitoring as a backup. So this is just an idea. I don't want this to be taken too seriously, but uh, David asked, you know, how could the Arduino community play in this? This is an example of something that almost every ventilator project could use. And, you know, I buy a lot of things from, let's say, Adafruit or whatever. I've got a flow sensor from Adafruit right here. If I had this, I think a lot of ventilator uh, projects could benefit from it. Basically, you want to plug something into the standard 22 millimeter airway, which is used for patients, that has redundant pressure sensors. And in breathing, what's important is not the absolute pressure or the atmospheric pressure. It's always the pressure relative to the outside ambient air. So the tube, which is going down the throat of the patient, inside that, the pressure is different than the pressure outside. What you really want is, is something which would reliably measure that. And unfortunately, sometimes those things get wet due to condensation. Sometimes the, the patient vomits, you know, other things can happen. So what I would like, and this is just an idea, I don't want anyone to really build this, but this is just an idea of what you could do, you know, is you could build a physical device that you plug into the airway that has three sensors on the outside sensing ambient air and three sensors on the inside sensing airway air, have a circuit which does a voting algorithm if one of the sensors is off, subtracts them and sends the difference via I2C to an Arduino. And the beauty of that system is then the Arduino doesn't have to use software to decode the pressure differential. Presumably it would be more reliable because once this module is fully tested, everybody can rely on it. So finally, ventilators are life critical machines. Reliability is absolutely key. And that means both software and electrical. Um, I believe the way that we can address this is through redundancy. Arduinos are cheap. There's no reason not to use three of them if it's gonna make your machine more reliable. So uh, unlike my, you know, my perception of the Arduino hobby universe, which has, has made cheap and flexible multifunction things, this domain requires a different mindset and believe it, it's hard for me because I'm, I'm mostly a computer programmer. I'm very fast and very sloppy. I, I am a terrible person to work in this domain. Nonetheless, I'm trying. Reliable is better than cheap and simple is better than multifunction. I know we need cheap ventilators in this situation, but it doesn't do any good if we kill the patient. Even in the places that I personally believe are going to be very hard hit, like India, um, we have to build reliable machines. And so my advice in this realm is harden, harden, harden. It needs to be so hard a meteor will bounce off it. I personally don't know how to do that, um, but I'm, I'm here to learn. I know uh, everyone probably listening to me is, is doing their best as well. And that ends my presentation. Back over to you, David. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, it was a very good introduction. Um, I wouldn't say I, I was missing your 
your famous table that everybody are looking at every now and then. Uh, but I guess it will be time to look at it later. Um, before we move into the into the rooms, we are running just a couple of minutes. Is, is, right now is just the right time, but I would like to um, address a couple of things. Uh, first of all, if anybody has any questions, uh, we have this Slack channel where all the all the questions are like sent back to me. So, if there's any questions to, uh, for for Robert, please bring them up. Uh, in any of the channels we are listening to, we have people both on YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, the Zoom channel and so on. So we can just uh, bring up the questions. Uh, so there is mostly comments. People have been reading reports all over the world. And uh, so there's comments I will just bring up so that everybody are aware of them. For example, Marcos Mendez mentions that Ambu bags are not available on three fifths of the world cities and small villages. That's why Ambuvent will not solve the problem. So that's a comment directly to one of the projects that is running around. Um, then there is uh, people mentioning uh, that it's proven that CPAM machines with continuous pressure generate an inflammatory case in the patient and increases the recover, or even it's why Italy had so many casualties. Well, I want to say uh, that, of course, there is a lot of reports that we have, some of us have read, so it's important that we keep track of all of the reports because research is happening as we go. And so it's important to keep this in mind. So it's not, uh, it's not an easy thing uh, to just be updated. Um, so Robert, I just wanted to ask actually in this topic, up being updated, like how do you keep updated? Because you have like probably, the most thorough study that you're working alone? Are you working with somebody? How are you collecting the data for your, for your study? Well, I'm in the Slack channel at incoronavirus.org. Um, there are other communities. Uh, I've got a list of communities at my, my website that list resources. So I started out getting a lot of, a lot of that. Um, since I published my spreadsheet, people have been sending me uh, GitHub issues and emails asking to add their projects. And I'm happy to do that, although it's it's hard to keep up with. Um, uh, so I've been relying on those people, and communities are also a good way for most most of the people on this call are probably not medical professionals to find medical professionals who can at least answer questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing this up. I think that's very important. Uh, we will bring this up in the next session, uh, but uh, uh, we were attending a meeting. With the Spanish agency for uh, the medicine and uh, medical products at the early this week and it was very clear to me that among the over 40 projects that uh, showed up in Spain to this meeting only those that had been working with uh, doctors and medical professionals from day one stand a chance of being approved for for medical trials so I think it's very important so right now I'm sharing the schedule to the conference. Uh, thank you, Robert. We invite you to stay with us throughout the conference. Uh, I would really love you to be at the at the ventilator session with with me. So if you want, I to will stay, be. Please stay with us. I, I'm sure you will get some new projects for your list. Um, uh, now we will divide ourselves in two rooms. Uh, if you are going to be discussing or you want to listen to the Arduino compatible ventilators, we invite you to stay on this room. If you're interested in other Arduino related projects, uh, please jump to the room number two that you will link, you will find it on the uh, conference call. And uh, we will continue in those rooms for uh, an hour and a half. Um, and we will be working on discussing about different projects, pitching them, bring up some questions and so on. After that, we will move into the second set of uh, sessions at between seven and 8.30. And it's very important that you consider that uh, definitely should consider to be one of those. Uh, we invite people from the ventilator projects to have one person at each because at the legal, we want to discuss about legal aspects at different countries. We will bring up what we have found in the countries we operate at and you're welcome to bring up your experiences in other countries when it comes to certification and other kind of legal aspects. And in room number two, there will be a conversation uh, with Dario Penisi, the head of hardware and the firmware at Arduino, uh, to discuss about the possibilities for supply, which are the best options in hardware and firmware at this point. So please uh, stay with us for the following 
three hours that are for sure going to be very, very interesting. So we're going to take a three minutes break so that people can move to the uh, different rooms. If you're interested in the session one, which is about Arduino based ventilators and medical, sorry, Arduino based, based ventilators, please stay at this room, room number one. If you're interested in other medical devices, please move to room number two. The link has been just posted on the chat on Zoom, and uh, you can also find it on the conference page. So we make a five minutes break and we're back with you. So just to clarify, we are right now in room number one. So if you're staying here for the Arduino compatible ventilators, uh, you are in the right room. So yes, uh, this is room number one. We're going to start talking with room ventilators. I'm Cesar here. I'm helping David to co-host this next session. And I will, I am reading through some of the people that have submitted entries and I'm going to check with, with you all so you can uh, introduce and present your project in the next block. So if you have submitted um, your project, I will given, I don't know if everyone is here using their names or maybe some other uh, nicknames. So I'm going to try to locate all of you and then uh, just I will just give you the floor so we can like um, know more about your project and learn about what you're doing here so David is there thank you for for that perfect I, I will just uh, write down your names and I will just uh, give you the floor in the given time thank you So in order to accelerate this process, I think will also help us if on the participants list you raise your hand and then will help us find you much faster because there is still 88 people on this line. So if you are one of the panelists, please raise your hand. We will double check and invite you all into the room.
Chairman, please. I see that you are uh, here from the Singapore. Yeah, Chairman, could you please raise your hand in the attendance list so I, we can just add you much faster. Is there anyone else attending that just submitted the form to the to present the project? So far, we had uh, fourteen projects. I'm seeing here we have nine panelists ready. If you are going to present, please just raise your hand. We will just invite you to to give you the floor. Okay, Ignacio is here. Oh, Felix, don't worry, we can remove you very quickly. Refer project to Marin David, okay. Marin David. Okay, um, I can see Marin David. I can see you here. I'm going to just connect you. MMC, MMC, uh, seven seven oh nine. I can't find you in the list <clears throat> of people that were accepted as panelists. Maybe you apply with a different email address. So just to confirm, we have as panelists uh, David Martin, Edwin Chu. We have also added Felix, Marcos Mendez, Marin Davide. We have Robert Lee. Uh, we also have from the team of Andrea Mima uh, Miguel. And we also have Sermon Chen. Yeah, you, you're already you're already in, David. Okay. Maybe we'll, I keep uh, just inviting uh, other people, David, maybe you could talk a bit about the dynamics for the session so everyone is aware. Yeah. So let me just, <clears throat> let me just uh, explain briefly how we're going to run this and I will now turn my video on so you can also see my face somewhere. Um, so the idea for the session is that every project will have five minutes to present. And uh, after that, there will be uh, a round of questions of a couple of minutes. We will be very strict with times. Oh, we're starting a couple of minutes late, but uh, not everybody that committed to be here could make it in the end. So, um, so uh, we will, we will uh, you know, continue until the time is over and then we'll move into the other sessions. So the idea is, again, we will open the floor for the projects one by one. We don't have a set order, so we'll basically ask you to stand, stand forward. You can raise your hand. We will see you raising your hand here and then we can just uh, 
bring you in. And then uh, we'll open the floor for five minutes and there will be some minutes for questions. So um, that said, uh, last minute for anybody that applied, uh, I was uh, selected as a panelist about ventilators. I would like to still in the room. I would like to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, people from New Orleans are <laughs> submitting the application now, but the thing is we, we did make a selection of projects uh, a while ago. Um, so at this point, yeah, we also invite Daddy Openisi, who is, as I said, head of hardware to be in the panel. And uh, uh, that way we can start. Anybody that is among the attendees applied for being in the panel and has not yet been brought up as a panelist? Okay, then we're gonna start. Uh, as you know, um, we, we've been, uh, there's been, at Arduino, the reason why we started this, this process is because at Arduino we've got a lot of applications uh, regarding help uh, on the use of, uh, the use of uh, Arduino boards on ventilators. And, um, and then of course, there was also a ton of projects that were dealing with uh, other issues around, um, around uh, you know, solving small things on a day-to-day -day basis that were using Arduino, mostly Arduino, Uno and Arduino mega boards. So we wanted to bring these cases up because we really want to help you guys. And uh, the way to do it is by, uh, is, yeah, by letting us know how, how far you are in your project. So uh, when you present, since you already have five minutes, I will ask you to please go straight to the point. Uh, I think Robert's presentation gave a pretty good introduction to the absolute basics of ventilators. So I don't think we need to talk about that. I think you should focus on how far you made it so far, which are the challenges that you are facing and um, and uh, how uh, uh, you know how far you are from from real uh, real delivery uh, okay uh, Ignacio since you took the floor I think you start <laughs> Ignacio you started sharing your screen so I'm gonna unmute you so you're gonna be the one starting now it's uh, a little a little helpful to see uh, which is now the the concept and uh, is kind of concept that it is uh, a little difference for the normal or standard concept that you have seen till now using ambus uh, normally all the all the project that has been presented this morning uh, as you see in the cotec foundation here in spain has been using ambush uh, with mechanical uh, pushing. Eh? So mechanical engines that push the ambu. And then the problem with all of these engines is that logically are running practically in a, uh, well, a steady mode. Eh? So our approach is kind of different, taking in account that we will use a CAF uh, from the, for example, a normal uh, tensiometer or uh, even kind of uh, bug uh, surrounding, the, surrounding the, the ambu and then using pressure, the outside pressure to push the ambu. So the idea is that we can in any time stop the pressure of the ambu or increase the pressure or even change any kind of uh, number of breaths per minute, taking in account that we will, of, of course, uh, get the pressure coming from the breath of the patient and then logically push or not push uh, the uh, device uh, surrounding the ambu. All of that of course, is uh, controlled by the Arduino. And Arduino uh, is fed with a program that I have, uh, well, uh, practically is uh, the team that we have here in the Polytechnic University that we have developed using reinforcement learning in MATLAB. 
So now uh, we have the MATLAB uh, uh, development and we feed uh, the Arduino. What are we looking now for the Arduino community? Well, the idea is that at the end, Arduino is uh, having the sensor, the pressure or several pressures. That is a very good idea. Even oximeter, that was another uh, sensor that, was, uh, that we were looking to implement. And so with all of these sensors, uh, we feed in the program, in the reinforcement learning, and at the end we control an, uh, uh, an air pump, finish. So anyone that uh, has implemented in an Arduino, an air pump, uh, like the ones that uh, is normally used with this kind of device, it could be very helpful for us. Uh, we will now implement all these devices next week on Monday, uh, we will start making tests in the University of Francisco Victoria, you know where is uh, Cesar, eh? and uh, we will use all the people in the uh, pharmacy and medicines laboratories, and of course doctor of these laboratories, eh, to implement with the maniki all of this setup. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think I'm, it I'm was talking silence. <laughs> quite clear. I don't know if anyone has any question. I will suggest we have for the following presentations, given that the time is limited, that uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can write it down in the chat. And after uh, the, the four minute presentation, we will just uh, uh, talk them a lot or just uh, put the voice. To them okay okay <clears throat> okay so uh, i do have a question for ignacio uh, because you just said that you're gonna start uh, some trials next week so uh how far have you tested it until now so you just tried the machine on you know on air so no no humans have been to try it out so far not so far eh? Uh, and even uh, I have making all these tests only uh, simulating in the MATLAB Simulink uh, environment. So uh, even I have not test with uh, a physical Arduino uh, because practically uh, now uh, Arduino without all the rest is kind of uh, unnecessary. Uh, so um, even uh, the idea is to have all this setup or this weekend eh, to start all the tests eh, on Monday or even tomorrow eh, to, to have uh, the possibility to speed up. Because as you know, here in Spain, the problem is that all the, all the developments that has been presented to our government has been rejected, all of them. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, for anybody that's interested, we will discuss about the Spanish case in the legal panel because have, we have a lot of information on that. Thank you, Ignacio. There seem to okay, be no quick questions right now. So we move to the next group. Uh, well, I would suggest Edwin Chu to be the next one. So we can unmute you. Okay. And if yes. you want to take the screen, uh, please, Ignacio, should stop sharing the screen. No, oh, I can't do it for you. And uh, Edwin, if you want to start, please unmute uh, yourself and share your screen if you want yes. to show anything. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, pleased to meet you all and uh, bringing the screen up now. Okay, my name is Edwin. I am here with a project called RespiroWorks. We're a team of about 40 engineers, doctors, and project managers and others helping us out. Um, this is what we're building. We are trying to build a minimum feature set that is uh, appropriate for uh, for treating ARDF specifically caused by COVID-19. So it's a sort of a reduced feature set, but trying to hit at least the minimum, uh, minimum viable functionality for taking a patient all the way through the progression of ARDF uh, all the way through to full recovery. Um, this is difficult, uh, as mentioned before, because the condition of the patient changes, the compliance and resistance of the lung changes. And so the, um, the design must be able to accommodate those. And so um, 
to pursue that, our um, our goal is to provide two modes of ventilation in particular, the assist control ventilation, which detects the patient breath, uh, the patient inspiratory effort, and then provides supporting pressure at various, uh, various degrees of support uh, to, to uh, change the amount of uh, assist. And then also for uh, patients that are incapable of breathing at all on their own, the uh, pressure regulated volume controlled mode of operation where the, um, the automated control of the ventilator controls the entire breathing cycle. Um, so what I can show here is a sensor plot. So this is a, um, a plot of data uh, from, our, uh, from our device, from our prototype run. And you can see the commanded pressure in the blue line here, the patient pressure in the red line here, and in the orange line, the volume measurement that we are taking. And so we, um, we have closed loop control, uh, commandability of the inspiration, expiration, uh, uh, timing ratio, the peak inspiratory pressure, plateau pressure, and the uh, positive and expiratory pressure or PEEP. Um, and each of these can be controlled uh, individually and separately. The final design will have an interface computer, uh, which will host a touch screen. Uh, this is the simplest and cheapest way to provide controls. Um, and that is separate from the real-time controller uh, for reliability and safety purposes. Uh, the real-time controller at this time is an Arduino Nano. Um, if we have the, uh, can I turn on the video here? Is that? Yeah, yeah, you can totally share it. You can share your screen and whatever you show on your screen will show up on the video, no problem. Okay. Um, but we, um, I, I can't seem to turn my uh, video camera on. I can actually show the prototype okay. here. If that doesn't work, I have a preloaded video that I can play. Mm -hmm. Essentially, our our design is based around the closed loop control of a blower fan. The uh, the unit we're using right now is from a CPAP machine. Um, and it seems like we can reliably get them in the hundreds to thousands um, from our supply chain. And I'm looking for my own video here. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I can, I can't seem to share the video, but I'll share it from the yeah. screen so that you can see yeah. um, my apologies there, but uh, here, uh, can you see this? Yeah. yeah. So we have a close, we have a blower. There's our, I'll just let the video do the, do the time. So we have a, um, we have a blower here. We have motor control and the Arduino here controlling the closed loop breathing cycle. Our pressure sensor here, which is uh, essentially a differential pressure across an orifice. This is our test lung that we're using to, to perform this test. Um, and then there's also a patient pressure sensor here so that we can control both volume and pressure independently. Um, our, uh, our, initial, our initial focus is uh, uh, we're working with a hospital in Guatemala, Hospitalo Atlan, um, uh, to provide them with uh, ventilators there. Okay. Yeah, that's all so I have. So there's a couple of questions for you. Uh, yes. So first of all, there's a question of whether it's a, it's a DC motor with encoder you're asking on YouTube. Yes, it is an encoder. Uh, okay. And of course, there is a question that says that whether these devices require medical approval, such as FDA. Um, you can say yes or no, and then we can discuss this further on the legal panel later. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we don't think that we can reasonably expect to get FDA approval in the shortened time frame, And so we are focusing primarily on countries that will be underserved by the global manufacturing push right now. We hope that most countries with uh, stringent medical uh, restrictions will be served by the the present manufacturing push by major manufacturers, and we're really trying to focus on countries that won't have that benefit. Okay, great. So there is another question here: What are the parameters that are required to control the rate of the pumping, blood pressure, air pressure? I, I know this question is a bit basic, but I think it's worth answering. Yeah, I, uh, that's a sort of a question of like minimum minimum viable capability. To, to treat the, the disease. And so far we believe, and, and talking, uh, talking with the doctors on our team that 
with pressure, with patient pressure sensing and inspiratory and expiratory volume sensing, we will be able to achieve both the um, PCV, P, uh, PR, VC, and the AC ventilation modes that are required. Um, so yeah, there's another question here just for you to confirm like, okay, so the whole concept is about to pump air in closed loop control with blood pressure rate. Um, with, uh, no, we don't measure blood pressure. Okay. It's uh, breathing, breathing rate, the inspiratory, expiratory, uh, timing ratio and the peep and the, uh, pit pressure. Yeah. I think this was explained earlier by Robert, uh, pretty well as well, but it's normal that we will get these questions because people are extremely curious right now. I bet there is a lot of people I would like to also help out building their own machine. So, uh, so there is uh, David, one uh, more question. Let me, let me also add uh, yeah. one interesting thing. Um, it's very important uh, to note that uh, since the maximum pressure would eventually blow up uh, the patient lungs, uh, it's important to have some mechanical uh, safeguards such as uh, uh, max pressure valves. So uh, don't even think about controlling max pressure with uh, sensors and microcontrollers. Okay. That's absolutely uh, right. Yeah, so yeah it, it's, not, it's not in this prototype here, but the final design has a pressure relief valve. Okay. Great. And, and there is five, two, two more questions and then we close uh, this panel because it's, uh, otherwise we run out of time. So uh, is there a filter for the air? And if so, yeah. where? There, there will be an inlet and outlet HEPA filter. Okay. So this is uh, this is more visible in this design where you can see the filters. Okay. Thanks. And we'll begin yeah. building this next week. Uh, yeah. And the final question, which is like the, of course, we have to ask this: Is it is the design open source? It will be. I think right now we're still in the prototype phase. So before we have something that we are confident works, we don't want to irresponsibly uh, mm -hmm. release it to the public. So are you planning medical trials at some point? Yes. So we will, we have, we're working with a number of doctors. So of course, this will be tested on mechanical simulators first um, before being used on any actual live patients. Okay. Um, perfect. So uh, I think Robert is posting also a comment saying I would not, uh, I, I would not describe it as purely a CPAP ventilator since the breathing is dynamic. And then also he has another comment that he disagrees that is uh, responsible to open source early. So I think uh, I think Roger and I are on the same political stance when it comes to open source. So there is different takes on this. I don't think we should discuss about this right now because we could talk for hours. So thank you very much, Edwin. Uh, thank you, we'll everyone. You a high five you. from Sweden. <laughs> Wonderful. And, um, we we <laughs> jump to the next group. Uh, and. Uh, who can we take? So Mar Marin Davide, if you would like to be the next. Oh, Robert said he was answering the attendees with those questions. They were not exactly for you. So I'm sorry. I was just taking the, <laughs> the questions from, uh, or the, the answers from Robert as if they were uh, for you as well. Okay. Marin Davide, yeah, you have the microphone open if you want to share your screen. Yeah, hello, hi. Hey. And uh, okay, I should be able to to share the screen also. Okay, so hello, I, I'm a, a designer. Normally I design uh, me mechanical machines uh, and uh, I have the, put up a small uh, suggestion for a design that is uh, shared <coughs> on GrabCAD also, so everybody can take uh, this and modify Basically, the idea is, is uh, to have a simple device uh, that can mechanically actuate the ambu bags. And uh, the idea is to use uh, uh, common parts so this design can be replicated in uh, developing countries or similar places. So it uses uh, a high helix uh, uh, screw bar and uh, common parts for a FDM machine like the stepper motor and uh, Arduino and controls. And uh, yes, it's a very simple design. Uh, someone I think, that's, uh, is already taking this design further and uh, improving and uh, making it better. And yes, I think that's, that's all. I don't want to take this too much long. So, yep.
let's see. Okay, so so you're presenting this uh, mechanical design. Um, um, so I think we could take a couple of minutes to eventually uh, give you some comments. So if anybody else has made mechanical designs would like to bring up any kind of questions, this is your opportunity. I would ask uh, probably the, the dumbest question on the earth, but um, this uh, kind of designs usually seem uh, pretty complex. And uh, I suppose that uh, 3D printing uh, will not be robust enough. So um, what is, according to you, to your experience, the, the best way, the best advice to give uh, to who wants to design similar uh, things to make them, uh, let's say, easily replicable, but at the same time, uh, robust and, and functional? Yeah, uh, on the Grebka page, I uploaded also a simpler design that uses uh, laser cut or CNC cut acrylic. So it's simpler and faster to, to be made. There are still some parts missing, some like connectors, but the idea is that, uh, yes, it's simpler to make than the 3D printed version. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we don't seem to be having a lot more questions and we are running, you know, a bit, a bit late. So we will jump to the next. Uh, thank you, Marin. Thank you. Uh, are you are, actually, I just want to ask, are you Marin David or David Marin? Uh, uh, Marin is the surname, David is the name. Yeah. OK, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, we've been calling you wrong the whole day. Ah, that's <laughs> no, no problem at all. OK. Thank you. Um, so we will take next the uh, Rea Mima project. So if you would like to open the microphone and uh, start sharing your video, please. Hi. Hi, can you see yes. the slides? Okay. Hi, my name is Miguel Madrid. I have been working 25 years in automation. And, uh, oops, I did. I think that I has put the wrong monitor. Okay. My project guide for the project is that the aisle is more complicated to handle. Uh, water is more easy to handle, and you can see the water and what happened with the water. My wife know very well because the prototypes had been has been uh, made in my kitchen, and my wife know that the water has been in the in every part of the kitchen. I have seen that uh, an ambu is a thing that is not uh, so easy to get, but you can get items to make a project in all the hardware shops, pet shops, electronic shops in all the world. I have been thinking in a reliable product that you know that everything will work uh, in any case. And I have think in very simple stuff that you can put together to get a ventilator. Also, very cheap components to make redundancy of sensor of uh, all the things that you have in the project. The hardware is very simple. You can see two boxes with two water pumps and one bottle that is connected to the, venti to the ventilator. You have one uh, CPU, one Arduino, PLC, Cmatic, and so on. One small screen with buttons in order that the doctor could put the values to the machine. And in this case, we have an ultrasonic sensor to know uh, the volume of the water that you are going to use. One pressure sensor and the relay that control the, the water pumps. You have here all the stuff that you need to make the project. At the beginning of the inspiration, you have all the water in the right tank and a few uh, water in the left tank 
so the eye can go into the bottle. When I start inspiration, the Arduino will, will say, uh, send the order to the relay to start the water pump. The water fill the bottle. The level of the water is controlled by the ultrasonic and also the pressure sensor. And when finish the inspiration, in the expiration, you send back the water to the right tank that you have in the, in the slide. The improves that you can make in the system, uh, for example, put an air diffuser for breathing that will get the right humidity to the air for the patient. A tank heater to get the right temperature to the air for the patient that you have in the system. You can put another system for the uh, expiration in order to keep the PIP value that you need in, in the system, and also a ultraviolet lamp to sterilize the water of the system. You have videos of the prototype, all the math that I have used, the code for Arduino, and everything in the web page that I have created this week. Okay, thank you so much. Um, are there any questions from anybody at the community for this presentation? It doesn't, it seems like what we have is a comment from Bob Martin and Bob Martin made it made a comment to Robert, but I think uh, maybe interesting. Um, there is a Michigan Instruments has lung simulators in case you people would like to be testing it. Uh, uh, Sherman Chen says it's a simple concept and Edwin comments as a great work. And Ethan Moses is asking whether tank pumps, uh, the airflow sealed or open? You can make both. You can make uh, open uh, in the case that you have nothing or you, you can make closed and you can make uh, another tank to uh, use uh, a mixer of oxygen plus air uh, air through uh, water to get the right humidity and warm the, the air, you can make everything. Ethan Moses comments again, says like he had a similar idea, but with an open tank, and he thinks they will need a very deep pump to achieve enough water pressure to achieve, for example, 45 millimeter, millimeters or of HG. 40 millimeters only. So. With a tank of half a meter, you have enough to create the, the pressure that you need. Okay. Uh, it looks like uh, we have another question. Do you have, do you have thought about, I, I can say this word, about <laughs> hydrolysis water for oxygen surgery? I did, uh, did not understand this uh, it says question. says like, if you had thought about hydrolysis water, I mean, I'm just reading the question, so I cannot <laughs> tell you much more than this. Uh, I, I don't know if hydrolysis water makes any sense to anybody if somebody in the chat would like to yeah francesco antoniella asks what about rhythm and pressure air uh, rhythm sorry rhythm and pressure rhythm and pressure uh, in the web that i has created you have everything all the math uh, calculation because uh, i have put the calculation to select the right pump the right water pump in order that the uh, uh, frequency that you want to their uh, uh, respiration and everything is in the <clears throat> in the in the web and also I has put my email in order that you want to make any question um, so there is another question here oh, well this question from David Thrower well there will be a recording while well, we're streaming live on YouTube David and of course everything's gonna be recorded and even the second track will be placed on a second uh, YouTube stream later on. So everything will be up and public. Uh, Darius also asking, uh, saying that it will be better to maybe use a water level sensor instead of a ultrasound. I, I wonder myself also whether this is just a choice because it's a sensor you had at hand or, or whether you think it's a better option for checking out the water level. With this water level, I have the, enough precision to get one centimeter of water. Okay, so you think that the ultrasound sensor 
uh, is good enough and it's also super it's cheap. more right? accuracy than the data uh, water uh, sensor. Okay. Okay. Ethan Moses is trying to explain the hydrolysis question from before. He's saying that maybe putting an anode or a cathode under the pump bottle uh, in order to make the either oxygen or, or hydrogen. So that would add oxygen to the pumped air. Uh, he's commenting also that he thinks that this idea is a crazily inefficient idea, but funny and clever and maybe shouldn't be immediately dismissed. Yes, I have dismissed this question because uh, when you make the, <coughs> the anode and cathode, you get a lot of dust and debris in the water. Okay, so then, then it's actually a bad solution. Okay. Um, then also they're asking, which is the, op the best Arduino board for this effort? For this effort, uh, you need to get a high precision and it's necessary to get a time uh, from the beginning to the end of the program of 10, 20 milliseconds. So I prefer uh, to get a faster one that you can get in, in the shop. Okay. And then the other question is whether the water will have the needed speed to generate 20 BPM. So I, I think you answered this yes. question. You said that yes. you have all the calculations uh, on your website. You can see all the calculations, all the math in the web page. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, you actually had quite a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> I think you, you gave us a, a lot of food for thought. So thank you so much. And uh, we're gonna change the next presenter. So Sherman Chen, if you would like to be the next one, please. Yeah, Sherman, you will see their microphone is unmuted, but we can't hear you. And also can't see your uh, screen or anything. In the meantime, there is a thank you comments for all the presenters until now, by the way. Uh, I think everybody's appreciating the work you guys made to present here today. All right. Can you guys yeah, hear me now? I can hear you now. Great. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. You should be able to see the screen now, yeah? Yeah, we're seeing your screen. So um, I'm from Singapore, right? So in the Southeast Asia region, um, my team and I, we are non-medical professionals. Uh, we are actually um, just hobbyists, makers. Um, and one of our teammates actually uh, runs a local manufacturing firm here. So he has a manufacturing plant. He has the... 3D printers, he has the uh, fabrication machines. He has the ability to help us uh, push out the production units at a later time when, when we get there. But right now, the very first thing that I have done is I have spoken to um, a few of the healthcare professionals in the region. I have friends working in the hospitals in Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, and in, even in Singapore as well. So, um, what I've understand so far is that when it comes to looking at suitable portable ventilator designs, one of the most suitable one right now is actually the Medtronic, which recently has been released. I, I believe some of you guys have heard of it, heard about it. So the Medtronic PB560 uh, model uh, is one of the closest uh, models that we can sort of use uh, as a blueprint. So we don't really need to build from scratch. Now the downside, the challenge of this, um, trying to build this is that the, if you were to look at the schematics, the design, the blueprints, they are actually not very helpful. <laughs> um, I can just open it up and you guys can see. Let me... So the, everything on this design, I mean, Okay, so number one, there are parts that are being used um, that apparently isn't available in our local region. I, I have done, I bought a lot of electronics from different distributors before. You talk about Mouser, uh, you talk about, uh, yeah, for example, Mouser. I bought a lot of things from Mouser. Um, some of the electronic parts that are being used in this original blueprint design is not available in our region. 
So, um, in, so what happens is that I started to look for suitable compatible replacements. Um, so one of the MCUs initially me and my team were thinking about is uh, STM. We were thinking about using STM uh, ARM processors. So then eventually I, I saw the ad about Arduino wanting to do conference. So I started thinking about the alternative of using Arduino. Um, and then we managed to shortlist the option to thinking about using the Arduino Due or possibly Arduino Mega. So what we really want to do is to come up with a design that is low power, right? Because the whole idea of having a portable ventilator is so that you know it can uh, be used over a long period of time. If you have been following the news, you know that a lot of the patients, when they go onto a ventilator, they are on the ventilator for up to three weeks. Right, so this portable ventilator has to be able to last that long, right? While still um, doing what it's supposed to do. So that is uh, one of the things that uh, we are trying to think about right now. Um, and obviously, you know, we want to work with, we want to collaborate with other makers in this community, like you guys, um, sharing notes, comparing notes, and and see how we can work together. Because reverse engineering this device. It's not going to be easy um, if you were to really download the schematics and look at it. It's available online. You can go to a Medtronic website. Um, there is not a lot of helpful information. They share a certain percentage, a portion of uh, their design, but they didn't share everything. So uh, it's more like to give you an idea and give you an inspiration of what you can do with it. Um, so yeah, I mean, right now the challenge for me is that I'm trying to reverse engineer this, um, but yeah, it's not easy. Uh, the good news is that locally and regionally, I do have access to uh, places where I can actually test the prototype if I manage to get to that stage. Um, for in terms of the apex, when you talk about the uh, peak, uh, where the healthcare system is going to hit the peak in the region, we are about a maybe three to six weeks away from hitting our apex. So if you work the timeline backwards, I have about three weeks, maybe four weeks to come out with a prototype and then the final two weeks to really ramp out the production unit and do, the, I mean, to do the testing and ramp out production unit. So um, that is what I'm looking at. So yeah, I mean, we, we are looking for medical professionals that can work with us on this prototype. Um, the medical professionals I know that have given me this advice uh, to use Medtronics or to reference Medtronics, they are healthcare workers busy on the front line, so they can't really consult in real time. So uh, that that is a challenge right now, yeah. So thank you, Sherman, for the presentation. I have a question. Now that you have reviewed all the components, do you think that these are readily available in most places or have you found or discovered any particular component that may be harder to get, even in uh, this time or in the future? Yes, I realized that some of the components, uh, even like the, the main CPU, the, the brain itself, the CPU, the my MCU here, uh, is not something that is uh, is sort of a discontinued part. I did a search on Mouser. They, they don't sell it anymore. Uh, I don't know whether it's just for this region and this part of the world, but um, yeah, it's just not available anymore. So I found an alternative, um, which is a STM L4 uh, MCU. That, that is a suitable replacement. Um, there are other parts I've also sourced out. I, I created a list, but I haven't released it because um, this list is work in progress. But I did find like a lot of the suitable, most suitable replacement parts um, for those parts that won't be available in the region. Um, and these are the parts that, you know, I'll, I'll definitely share this list of parts in a, in a Google spreadsheet uh, with other makers in the region, you know, if they are interested to use it as well. So, yeah.
Okay, Sherman, so thank you for your question. I think it was really interesting to have this uh, vision after the release and to be able to just check and, and see teams working on the on these efforts. Uh, I'm going just to give the floor uh, to, let me just uh, give the floor to, I don't know if David, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I was letting you talk, but I, I, I think next next one in line is the Resistencia team. So I don't know who from Resistencia is going to be taking the floor. Okay, David. David, can you please open your microphone, open your screen, and the floor is yours. We have also added uh, that Robert will speak at the end to, to present the... Uh, present the uh, bent mon uh, because he 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 has some information he would also would like to share and we have the opportunity because we're running really well with time so david please floor is yours okay uh, may i start video no i can okay uh so i will share a screen here Let me see. No, it's not this one. Sorry. <laughs> one second, please. Right now. So, can you see it? Can I? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We can both see you and hear you perfectly. Please. So I think this is time to think in important and transcendent things. This is time to realize we are just humans. We plan. God has the last word. Uh, and this is time to do our little bit to help others. In Spanish, we have a say, adios rogando y con el mazo dando, sort of strike with the rod why you beg to the goal. So this is why I ended up with these great people you can see in, in the photograph. They are in Oviedo, is north of Spain, uh, in the Bioterio. Uh, of the University of Oviedo is a place that where they work with animals and research and they have uh, places for us to test these machines. So we are very, very proudly uh, announcing and uh, telling you that we have our uh, prototypes working and tested on uh, animals with uh, a lot of success and uh, we are now uh, struggling because yes, it's not easy to have uh, the, these, these machines approved for uh, use on humans and running all over Spain. So we hope to have this uh, done very shortly. But uh, as you know, it doesn't depend only on our work, but it's our desire. So uh, yeah, as David said before, in this journey, it was very difficult to work remotely. Uh, uh, having our prototype, our only prototype in place in Oviedo and uh, collaborating all uh, from different places in Spain. But some of us were able to join the, the crew here. So uh, about ventilators, we are, uh, a lot of people uh, is working in ventil ventilators. That's very, that's great. Uh, but we did focus in, focus in a ventilator especially designed for the most critical COVID patients that includes PEEP and triggering functions. PEEP is a, a special function that you re require to maintain the lungs of the patient open because, you know, with COVID, uh, the, the, the illness makes the alveoles, the, the little bugs in the lungs to collapse and you have to retain a little amount of pressure there. So we comply with that and also triggering to allow the patient to make uh, autonomous respirations, inspirations when he's recovering or she's recovering. So we tested it like a week ago uh, with a little pig. We call her, uh, we call it Peppa Peep because of the Peep uh, function. Uh, it was great, but it was, uh, um, a test for um, healthy, a healthy patient. And yesterday we did 
with very great success, as you see in the photograph, everything is happy, everyone is happy. We tested it on animals uh, with, uh, I mean, simulating the worst situations uh, with li liquids flowing in the lungs that you can, do, uh, in fact, you have in COVID patients. So the machine worked really great. This is a second version of it. And this is the one we are about to release uh, because it's uh, open source. It's an open source design. It has a mechanical design. It has. Uh, it is based on a on an Arduino Mega twenty five sixty uh, um, controller board, and uh, has uh, a lot of uh, pressure. Uh, flow uh, sensors. Well, I don't know. Only the, the one you require, but it has a lot of uh, sensing mechanisms. Also, uh, uh, this um, security release uh, valve for taking care of the lungs of the patient in case something goes wrong. And this PEEP valve. So I don't want to extend in that part. So um, as I said, it's an open source project, and I will ask you at the end to collaborate with us uh, if you are uh, willing to. Um, so, yeah, uh, we are not using a regular AMBU. I, I'm going to show you a couple of videos, if it's okay. I don't know if you can hear them, but anyway, uh, if it's en enough, if you can watch them. So let me change the sharing. So we are not based in a regular AMBU that is not valid for coronavirus uh, uh, critical patients. It's not valid for, it's not good for continuous ventilation as it does not clear goodly enough the carbon dioxide out of the lungs. It, it can provoke death in a maximum of three hours. So this is, uh, this is conceived for short-time patient support. But instead of that, we are using a Jackson Rees breath breathing system with every hospital has in excess. This uh, gives the name of the project Respirator, Respirator 25. So I'm going to put one video. Allow me, please. I'm sharing this screen. So you can see it at work a little bit. Can you see it? This is similar to an AMBU, but it's not an AMBU. It's a Jackson Reese uh, system. And this is, a, to the right, you have a simulator, a lung simulator. I will put you a second video, very short too. Cierrame la puerta. Okay, so uh, I hope you like it. We are amazed with <laughs> this working at last. Uh, so I am going to show you a last image. Just one second. Yes, have it here. Yeah. And allow me to, yeah. So, uh, we, we could see a lot of amazing things during the, pro the procedure. Uh, we have been, we are very uh, grateful because uh, everyone has been uh, very helpful uh, to, to help with these uh, difficulties of, uh, of the time. Uh, we, we had the army bringing us 
the doctor, we have been working with a lot of doctors and opinions, medical opinions, but we have Ramses uh, that is working uh, with us remotely, but now he, he has been uh, bring to Oviedo for the testings through, uh, with, uh, I mean, by the Spanish army, that, that was great. And uh, we also are, I want to thank all our families because it has been a, a very, very difficult time. So now uh, in this last image, you can see respirator 23 resistencia team that is part of coronavirusmakers.org. We are a very huge crew of um, volunteers um, at, and we are working in uh, small uh, work teams. So uh, we, ha we are about to release this part that is a, a minimum system. In the, in the testing, we used uh, an example of display plus system, but it's not the last one. So we are going to release this for all the world. Minimum system is an Arduino Mega 2560 that works as a master. It's a, it is totally working. It has a small LCD, 20 by four characters, and uh, some switches, push button, push buttons, and an encoder. This is all you need to, to have it working. But uh, I, I will, uh, as I said here, please join us here. We need your help. We, are, uh, we have defined a serial protocol so that uh, in every situation, in every scenario, in every country, uh, depending on the uh, display options you need or you have in stock, you can design your own uh, display plus system that has graphic display because the LCD shows all the values, real measures and, and settings, but you cannot see the graphs, the real time graphs. So you have a graphic display here, also, you can uh, uh, put user interface and also IoT connectivity to allow doctors to uh, supervise a couple of uh, a group of uh, some ventilators from only a place. So I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, David and all the staff. Uh, I don't know if it's okay. David, you have a lot of questions, so stay with us. <laughs> okay, great. There is like a bunch of questions. First of all, uh, I will start by the, taking the chat from Zoom because people in Zoom uh, have been very active and, and questions have not necessarily been copied to the, the list we have. Uh, so, first, uh, first, I was commenting just to make clear because people were asking that this is based on the Jackson Reese uh, pump. Uh, also, um, yeah, so the question from Greg was, what does this sign use to create pressure? So it's basically the JSON reason you're pushing with that uh, lever, right? Uh, then... There is also this question from Robert that says, is resistencia the same as coronavirus maker? Well, coronavirus maker is a large community. There are like I don't know, 16,000 people right now. And Resistencia is, is one of the teams that just started working on this project, the res respirator, but there are also other teams working on other features or other models. But so far, uh, Resistencia is like the one that has gone through the clinical trials and, and all the stuff. So that's right, Edwin, that's right. Edwin tells you like, excellent work, David. And Sherman congratulates that you're using this uh, processor because you uh, think they also can use it. <laughs> uh, he's saying also, what do you use to control the amount of pressure and controlling the inspiration expiration? If you can confirm the kind of sensor you propose in the design. Yeah, we are using uh, some. Uh... We we are using uh, well I can I uh, I can I can tell you now the exact uh, reference but we are about to release the full documentation so that uh, it will be re released soon so the thing is we have been uh, using or testing several different kinds 
uh, that 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 is depending on the availability on the moment on the market. But uh, with some with with all the different possibilities, we have make it work. So it is not difficult to adapt it depending on the stock in the market. There are several options. Okay, I think that I think that very much answers the question. And the also, a sensor to yeah, okay. the yeah. Also, there was an option to uh, to control the the flow uh, with um, pressure sensing, but finally we are not uh, using uh, pressure sensing for the flow, but a dedicated flow sensor that is okay. very very precise. I think that's actually a really good tip because <laughs> maybe we are using pressure sensors instead of flow sensors. So this is a really really good tip. Also, uh, Robert is asking whether. You can later just publish on the chat, which is the, the GitLab link to your repository. So when people, when you guys are releasing, they can follow up with you directly. Great. Uh, great, great. It was missing on the slides. Uh, also, yeah, it's very encouraging. Again, they ask for a URL. Um, and uh, also, Ignacio says that the Simulink uh, interfaces also use the same, uh, can use the same board. Uh, people are looking forward to the documentation and uh, yeah, some question here. Yeah, uh, Aditya, Aditya Kombe uh, says that use stepper motor in a scissor like mechanical design. What are the components and displays and sensor? So I think most likely, I think it's better just to mention which uh, stepper motor you guys are using uh, just to give people an idea on how much strength you need to push on the on the JSON. Jackson Rees uh, pump. Yeah, I can answer yeah, uh, right down now that we are using a NEMA 24. Uh, the name was because we started with a NEMA 23, but we are using a, a little bigger motor. It's a direct drive to a lever in Spanish. I don't know the, it's a, a, lever. <laughs> a lever, yeah, a lever with um, a spiral shape that uh, is very, <laughs> very beautiful. In, to see it, but uh, makes yeah. This is a yeah, like a spiral shape lever that moves this uh, mechanism. Okay. But uh, it has to be very strong because uh, instead of what we uh, thought at the beginning, you need a lot of strength to push the air to the right uh, uh, speed. Okay. Uh, also, basically, uh, yes, the last question from Dario, our head of hardware, is asking uh, which is the availability of the RIS uh, pump? I think you mentioned it in the beginning, but... Uh, yeah, basically, I, I was uh, about to ask because David said that uh, there is, uh, um, there are plenty of these uh, in hospitals, and I wonder uh, if he's assuming that hospitals will uh, reuse what they have in-house or... Uh, if this is something that is uh, usable, um, easy to source uh, somewhere? Both, both. Uh, but mainly, uh, as to my knowledge, hospital has this as uh, uh, in intensive care for uh, taking care of patients uh, for, a, for a while. The thing is, they have a lot of them, but they don't use it that much because they require a, a person only for ha uh, having it uh, pushed all the time, all the time, all the time. So uh, in, in opposition to AMBUS, AMBUS uh, are now in a little shortage. These, these ones you have ready to go in many places, many hospitals. And the only thing is you don't have hands enough to move them. So you put this hand that is uh, electronically calibrated and regulated and with uh, the doctor has eyes on the graphs. So and it's protected in pressure and uh, volume and everything. It has alarms implemented. So uh, it's a way to reuse the stock they already have. And also if they need to produce this, it's not uh, very difficult to do, to do that. So thank you so much. It's probably the most advanced, or without any doubt, it's the most advanced of the ventilators we're seeing here today. So Edwin Chu in, in the chat just shared, um, a link for flow measurement in mechanical ventilators, a paper that I think we will just uh, resend uh, to everybody in the chat. And uh, so thank you, David. Thank you so much.
we hope to see you in the hardware conversation later with Dario more in depth to discuss about availability and supply chain, which I know is uh, something of the, some of the questions you guys really, really have right now. And uh, I wonder whether there's anybody else that uh, are uh, missing to talk. Marcos, haha. <laughs> Marcos, come on, bring it up. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcos. I am from Brazil. I don't know. Do you hear me? Yes, you're good. Uh, okay. So, uh, um, our project started because we saw that in Europe, in Ireland, and uh, in the United States, a lot of people from nice universities were trying to solve the problem of a ventilator. The problem today is not to build a ventilator, but to build a ventilator on a scale on economic uh, crisis in the entire world and with a very few resources for 8 billion people on the planet. Uh, on my way of seeing, the problem is not an engineering problem, but a logistical problem, actually. Um, the first thing we saw, the ambu bags, uh, I live in the biggest city on the Southern Hemisphere and I couldn't find one ambu bag in the entire town. So uh, that was the beginning of our ventilator. Uh, we joined forces with uh, Jeremia Salmada in Argentina, Washington also in Argentina. We have Ethan Moses in the United States and 200 other people that thinking to solve the problem on a African, uh, in a North African country or here in the countryside of West Far, um, states of Brazil. So we discard the, uh, we are not considering using stepper motors like on the primarily project. Of course, the stepper motors can be implemented, but they are not easily found in third world countries. Ambu bags also, complex valves, neither. Like complex valves, par uh, Parker, that's the biggest uh, um, manufacturer in the world, cannot produce 5 million valves in, I don't know, two years. So it's impossible to solve the problem on this approach. Uh, and also compressed air on the central of the hospital is not a possibility for us because many of the hospitals that the government are, is making here in Brazil are tent in the middle of football fields. So probably they won't have compressed air compressed and uh, the air compressed uh, solutions are like a shared and normally 20 patients share on a single compressor. If it fails, that it fails a lot. I do clinical engineering service for more than 700 uh, bases of health here in Sao Paulo with the company. And uh, so we know that uh, compressors fail. Uh, we developed a, a, like a, a bellow system with a car tire chamber. Uh, we are using a wiper motor, a DC to 12 volts car window wiper motor because it's widely available almost anywhere in the world. Uh, and if people need to disassemble a car to save a life, it's possible to do that. Uh, the machine is totally agnostic on hardware. So you can use a bellow if you want, or if you have access to an ambu bag, you can put an ambu bag also. Uh, we are trying to solve the problem as little as possible uh, on the, on the I, I don't know how to say the, um, electronics hardware that uh, that's needed for the project. Uh, we, we want it to be as little as possible. The video I'm showing to you is only a power supply of a PC, um, a wiper motor. And in this case scenario, we have volume, mechanical volume adjustment from 200 milliliters to one liter. That's another complicated problem that think that people are not thinking is that you have to pump almost one or 1.2 liters in a in a few in a second actually. Um, so we did two models. The one that I'm showing to you in the video is the Spartan model, as we call it, because you just need you don't need any electronics at all, and probably we can save someone on level two or three possibly of the coronavirus uh, crisis. This ventilator is only for the coronavirus. 
and it and we have a pip valve, we have a expiratory pressure valve, we have all the mechanics made to work on the on the system uh, as as possible without electronics. But on a level four case of the coronavirus, we would need to have electronics because uh, the curve of the inspiratory pressure and the expiratory pressure is very essential. And, uh, and also uh, the oximeter and the heartbeat sensor. Uh, we realized that a lot of CPAP um, models were generating inflammatory on the patients and that their recovery was more slow or even they died because of the inflammatory. So you end killing the patient not of the COVID-19 problem, but with a, a heart attack problem or something like that. Uh, the Spartan model is like almost to be built without any electronics, but we need help to uh, build the, the Mark II model that will have all the electronics needed uh, to control the pressures and everything uh, that, that we need to, to, to solve. Here is a diagram. So we have the bellow here and uh, we did with some uh, PVC tubing pipe with a normal hardware store. We built up uh, some check valves and the, div the diverter valve that Ethan is working right now is to solve all the electronics problems because with a few valves and, uh, and a tank of water with bleach inside, we solved the filtering problem and also the complexity of the uh, involuntary breathe or if the patient wants to breathe out and the machine is trying to breathe in and all that kind of uh, weird stuff that happens on a really complicated clinical issue. So our team started working on the Spartan model as a, a way of trying to solve the problem on a global scale. Uh, and after the Spartan model, we say, okay, we have something that works for level, well, actually level one, you just put a mask with oxygen. Uh, level two, maybe you can ventilate uh, the person. And uh, like level one is someone that's infected and doesn't have symptoms. And level two is the mask of oxygen. Level three and four, you have to ventilate the, uh, the patient. So uh, on level four, we would need a very fancy, pressure sensors to uh, have a very good precision on the millimeters of water that and the curve that this pressure is taking inside the patient's lungs. And on my way of seeing that I, I saw a lot of engineering approach, but uh, all these engineering approach have to consider that we have medical concerns that are really, really important. So we have to pump, for example, a lot of air in a short period of time, like one second, and the breathe out must be sometimes like in six seconds. That's why, for example, the Spartan model, we are using a simple end switch and a relay to have two speeds to adjust, uh, or maybe three or four with some resistors, and they don't, so we can manually jack in a plug and jack out from one and another plug to have uh, this kind of resolution between inspiration and expiration um, timing. Also the frequency, we have to put a potentiometer to increase the, the voltage on the motor. And with this the Mark II version, that's the most important, that's why we are calling you from Arduino, is that uh, we would need Arduinos and some kind of fancy sensors to solve that, but we won't have the problems of the fancy valves that uh, we like electronic valves, we can use solenoids and uh, some kind of um, airflow meters and that kind of stuff. But um, I can show to you like uh, now we have the, I have the machine working right now with me. Like uh, you cannot start your video because the host has to stop it. Um, so I cannot show my video camera, but um, let me see if I can uh, show. Like we have uh, uh, some pipings that we do the um, here. On these are the valves that we made on on three D printing, and we are like uh, making the valves on the PVC tubing. Marcos, also... we can't see you right now. I think you have to start your camera. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I send you a request when you when you mentioned that is uh, yeah. You know the interface. <laughs> 
start video. Uh, st you you cannot start your video because the host has stopped. It. I don't know oh, why. That's uh that's weird. As as host, I can tell you, I'm sending you ask start video. Okay. Maybe I have to rejoin the room. But uh, well, no, doesn't matter. So I, I can show it to you here, like on, on the. Uh, yeah. So here we have a tubing. And we have the overpressure valve that it opens like automatically if the pre patient wants to breathe out and we are trying to push air in. So this is adjusted on a tubing, like a Vino tubing, you can find it on hardware store. And we have a ruler on this tubing and you can put it down, uh, for example, like 40 centimeters if you want as maximum pressure. The PIP valve pressure works in the same principle. So this is like a pneumatic problem that we solved. And uh, the most complex thing is this diverter valve we have here that uh, when the patient tries to breathe in and breathe out in a really weirdly way, he redirects like oxygen uh, from the main system or he uses the bellow to push air to the patient or uh, on the exhalation part, it filters here on the bleach because this tank is full of bleach and we have a UV light up here. Marcos, uh, Marcos, I don't want to stop you, but the thing is that we are not seeing anything. We are, you are not sharing your screen right now. Ah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> so uh, at some point, at some point, it, it went off. Maybe when you try to sh share your video or something. And oh, okay, so okay. really sorry. Yeah, so no really worries. Sorry, guys. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I was here with the, the. So here I have a video of it working yesterday. I didn't had a. Um, do you see my screen, right? I used a condom because I didn't have a balloon or a glove, sorry for that. This is the, the diverter valve and uh, we use it like, uh, here I don't have any electronics and with this tubing system, I adjust the pressure, the max pressure and the PIP valve pressure. This is bleach, so the bleach is, uh, I don't put it the light so because you have to see but uh, when the, 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 like the lung goes out, the, all the, the, the contaminated air goes through this bleach bubbling system. So we can, uh, we can like, uh, um, as, as I can show here on the, on the photo. And uh, so our main objective on the project is to solve the problem for the poor people around the world because uh, we work, I work with clinical engineering and normally with a couple thousand dollars is very easy to solve a ventilator. It's not a hard work. The problem is to make it with a lot of few resources and with the economical situation of the entire globe, stop it. Like for example, HIPAA futures that everyone is considering to use uh, 3M yesterday in the United States was closed by the government because it was a security state situation. And the, the Americans like, they are not exporting any more HEPA futures. So uh, also the fancy valves for flux controlling and volume control and these kind of sensors, they are very, very like handmade, handcraft made or something like that. And um, they are not available everywhere in the world. So we, do, we did with some pipe tubing and uh, some, I don't know, uh, like vino hosing the entire machine. And we need to improve this machine to use sensors on a global scale because mostly of the problem is to use like cheap sensors, like the, the Arduino sensors for something that has a, a critical mission control that um, we have to solve. That's a patient on level four of the crisis, for example. Um, about a lot of people is going to ask about the concerns about improvement and all the kind of stuff. And I suggest to you ask that to a mom that has a, a kid that's dying and ask if the mom prefers to the kid to breathe on a tire chamber of a car for two weeks or to die. That's, that's, that's my answer for the, the clinical people that's worried about. And okay. um, Marcos, uh, okay. thank you. <laughs> I think you you actually made a really good point, uh, and uh, I have to say I'm I'm really pleased that you brought your project 
because it's really showing yet another approach. I have to say the some of the projects that we saw in Spain made by car uh, factories were very similar from the perspective that they use the same kind of motor, but they were, of yeah. course, pumping on an Ambu bag instead of having to make their own bag as you guys made here, which I have to say I totally respect. It's a super impressive tool. And I all, personally, I'm also the same opinion that uh, uh, if if this is the only solution, we should do it. You know, that's a personal personal opinion. I'm not representing anybody but myself. But we have a couple of questions that uh, we're running a little bit late, but we're going to actually make it three minutes late if if the organizers allow me. So, um, so uh, there is Sorry, a question cannot... here. Is it possible Sorry, to regulate to... the uh, milliliter inspiration volume? Yes. So we developed, uh, I can show it here uh, again. Sorry. So here on the website, uh, you can see here is a crankshaft. And uh, also we have a rotary uh, like a disc. And this rotary disc, uh, we have several um, like uh, here you can see better. This was the old version. So one part of the disc is, is for motors that spin less than 180 degrees. And the other part of the, of the, of the holes on the motor is for wiper motors that rotate more than 180, so 360 degrees. Uh, each each uh, hole is a resolution. So we have from 200 milliliters to one uh, liter of volume, but we had to increase these to 1.6 liters. So it's not a big deal. This is a manual adjustment. So the doctor, and this is the kind of thing that doesn't change in a, in a clinical situation. So you keep the volume mostly constant when you okay. stabilize the patient. There's one more question. Is there a relief valve in the circuit? I worry about the one liter volume or over one second. Yeah, for one liter volume is for a guy like 120 kilos, not for an old lady who is nine years old. Okay, so this is a, a medical question. Um, yes, we have an overpressure valve, so you, you can regulate this overpressure valve between whatever you want from 10 centimeters of water to one meter of water. Uh, probably with one meter, you can kill the patient, but uh, the recommended maximum is 50 centimeters of water. 50, okay. 60. Thank you. Well, Rob Collins wanted to join the last second. He says that the connection is not reliable on his side. So, uh, Rob, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, thanks for coming. But we, we have to move on. Uh, there is a lot of kudos for, for Marcos. Uh, and actually, people here said you should not be ashamed of showing the, the condom video. I mean, you get 10 points for creativity from Sherman. And uh, plus one from me, I have to say, I didn't see it coming. And I'm really glad that... that uh, you know, you use whatever. At, at least you made tests. Some of people don't even make tests. But uh, yes. I really love, uh, I really love the presentation. So I think I want to thank everybody for this first session. I hope that all of you brought a second person to be David, at the legal panel. I think so, Marcos, you also came with uh, with somebody so else, that's right? Willing to join us? Just openventilator.io. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Of course. Sorry, I forgot. I forgot about mentioning that. Uh, so, as I said, uh, Sherman is mentioning that he knows how, how he can collaborate with you. He's saying just right now in the chat, and he's giving some open source designs on 3D printable uh, flow sensing devices and other things that he thinks could help you because they will cost nothing. Okay, so, uh, please join our Slack channel and uh, on the hardware, we, we, we kind of need to solve the problem. Like imagine that you are on an Indian village in the very far away town in Brazil. So you have mostly a hardware store and some kind of electronics. And if you are blessed, Arduino will send a board for you. <laughs> well, that could be discussed. Uh, so... Yeah, by the way, as we were talking, I just found the uh, setting for turn, turning on the camera. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody that participated in this panel. Uh, I'm really glad that we got such a broad selection of presenters. I want to thank Alessandra Nelucci, who's at the other panel, who helped us uh, choosing the panelists. Now we have to move on to the um, 
to the next set of panels. So we're gonna use a couple of minutes to just uh, get a glass of water, change room to the other room. So whoever is gonna be uh, discussing about the legal aspects uh, around their projects, please stay on this room. Whoever is going to be uh, willing to discuss with Dario Benisi, our head of hardware and firmware about supply chain, software, firmware of any kind, please join room number two and uh, we will uh, continue talking. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, virtual high fives to everybody. So uh, right now it's uh, 7.04 in uh, Sweden. We are running four minutes late, but we're gonna give ourselves another five minutes so that we can, uh, so that we can uh, move on. In the meanwhile, Marcos is taking the opportunity to show his machine running live now that the camera works. Great. <laughs> Okay. So this is the overpressure. So we have the ruler here that uh, we adjust the centimeters. And uh, this is the crankshaft that I wanted to show you. So uh, and uh, really sorry, guys. I am oh. I am really worried because a lot of people is starting to die here in Brazil. Uh, don't be sorry. We will see what we can do to help you out. So please join us in the other meeting and discuss with Dario about the possibilities. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody, let's take five minutes break and we continue in a short time. So now we call in room one to the panelists that have been selected to be part of this panel. So each one of the groups that are gonna stay in room one, you're welcome to stay in the channel. Uh, if there is somebody from the project I just presented that want to stay in room one for talking about legal aspects, please uh, raise your hand so we can elevate you to be a panelist. Otherwise, if you're going to room two, uh, please follow Dario Panisi and Alessandra Nerucci to discuss about technology implementation, supply chain, and other technical aspects. So attendees in room one, um, please raise your hand uh, if you are part of the panelists so we can add you to the panelist group.
Cara, eu tava chorando por causa da tua mãe, mano. Por favor, Amanda, me mantenha atualizado disso aí, por favor, tá bom? A mãe da Amanda tá com febre faz três dias e ela tá me ajuda. Ok, we make a last call to the panelists for room number one on legal and certification challenges in the COVID-19 crisis. We're still lacking at least one more person who is Miguel Angel from the coronavirus makers from Spain. Uh, who is working on masks and is working with the homologation process. Uh, then we will be ready to start. If there is anybody else in room one that uh, belongs to any of the projects and would like to be part of the panel, please raise your hand and we will bring you in. And uh, Otherwise, we're ready to start for this uh, for this panel, which is a lot more of a discussion. Uh, once we make a brief introduction by by Cesar, uh, it would be nice if we all turn on the cameras and we can have an open discussion about legal aspects regarding regulating different things. We have a guest, uh, but Cesar will make the proper introductions. So uh, let's mm -hmm. just. Uh, Start the video and continue. Okay. Just looking for the right window and I stopped sharing so that you can take over the floor. Yeah, okay. Welcome everyone to this uh, second panel. I'm very happy. I'm just seeing David. Uh, I don't know why. I just see your huge. <laughs> so maybe I should just uh, start sharing the screen or I don't know why you are appearing super huge on the screen right now. So just give me a second so we can fix that and I can just uh, put my camera. So for this panel, we have uh, David Martin who represents the Resistencia project from Spain. Ignacio that was also present at the previous panel. Jose Gomez Marquez, who is our special guest. And as I said, I will make the proper introductions. Marcos Mendes, that has, was the last presenter in the last session on the panel on ventilators and the representatives for the RIA MIMA project. Um, so we're good to go. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to try to just uh, share my screen. I think, just give me a second. Oh my gosh, one second, please. 
I know why I'm I'm seeing all the time the wrong uh, video. Just so I have done this few times today. I'm going to share this um, brief brief introduction to know about. I don't know if you can uh, confirm that you are seeing my screen, but I don't know why I'm sharing the other screen all the time. Anyway, I will try to go back. So. Uh, my name is Cesar. I'm going to do a brief introduction on uh, things we have been working on for the last uh, days or weeks in Spain. I have been uh, working with a, with a group of people here trying to uh, document and share information about uh, COVID-19. And I'm going to start. If you can confirm that you can just check this presentation, someone in the chat, maybe. Now we uh, see your screen, Tessa, it's going. Okay, so thank you, David. So, uh, so far, three weeks ago, we started uh, just uh, launching this kind of platform, the forum uh, with uh, Coronavirus Maker, that is a community, but it's also kind of a forum. So far, the, the forum, uh, has reached in uh, two weeks, like 3,000 people sharing information, sharing knowledge. And one of the biggest challenges we had was the, the problem on certification, legal aspects, implications. So I, I like to do kind of a, to start with a, a very brief introduction about the, how is it going in Spain? Because there have been a lot of questions, there have been a lot of activity. So I think that uh, offering this can be a bit helpful for people that are outside Spain, but also will help us to kind of frame the some of the issues regarding the legal aspects. So just to give you a, a, a overview, uh, in this, in this uh, forum, what we try to do is to create knowledge with all the people that has the expertise on what can be useful and needed in times of this crisis. So, for example, one of the, the first articles that was proposed in the forum was this kind of specification for a respirator uh, useful for, the, for this crisis. And this was written by a doctor called Pancho Cañizo from Gregorio Marañón Hospital after consulting with several people because uh, three, three weeks ago, we had no clue about, okay, what are the actual interesting parts so what we try to do here is to gather all this knowledge and share it with other people so we can indeed uh, create a useful respirator or useful solutions. So we have already talked about resistance team. We also have one of the members here. So uh, yeah, this is kind of one of the first projects that was uh, covered and was launched in this uh, community. And one of the interesting things in this uh, whole um, community is that so far people have been creating um, industrial version and maker versions of several prototypes. One of the uh, most important parts of the process, and I was talking with Jose a few <laughs> minutes ago, is that we had the chance to have people uh, working from totally different areas for example, uh, this is a project called Sirio. And this project was uh, started by someone doing 3D printing here in Madrid and a company creating medical devices in Murcia. So this kind of collaboration has been possible in the last uh, days. Other parts, maybe Miguel Angel would like to talk uh, about, there are a lot of solutions being covered in the, in the forum that usually, uh, if we think about the legal or the regulatory, uh, would have a hard time passing by, maybe, <laughs> at this uh, right now, like, for example, this kind of alternatives for lost core resources. M Miguel Angel has been creating a lot of good content on, for example, how to filter the output of respirators. If you don't have filters, the, the output of the ventilator could be filled with viruses in, in aerosol uh, uh, solutions, so they could be dangerous. So there are solutions like passing by the, the air through a column of water. And after doing some research, uh, it seems like after one meter, uh, it eliminates most of the viruses. So 
the forum we think it's a place where we can gather knowledge and also propose new new solutions uh, so far the topics have been like respirator but also face mask filter uh, mask uh, data science a lot of different topics have been covered so far uh, most of this work has been done by volunteers and organized in telegram groups uh, so far there are like 100 national groups 20 international groups that are trying to replicate and collaborating in this topic it's mostly spanish speaking people but do we have groups from germany from uk and other places and um, we have these um, thematic groups where they talk about filtering systems and stuff um, one of the biggest challenges so far has been uh, producing useful stuff and um, i'd say the biggest success so far has been creating this kind of face shields that would prevent uh, people that are exposed to the virus when uh, someone coughs or someone kind of um, spits on you because of this or sneezes, it could transmit you the virus. So uh, there have been several designs of these um, pieces that is kind of a face protection. And one of the most interesting aspects, there are 16,000 people and so far in Spain, they have been producing around 40,000 masks per day, producing and, and delivering. So I think it's, 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 it's it by itself really interesting. They are serving this to the hospitals. They are serving this to people in need. And one of the, on, on one hand, this has inspired traditional industry because right now there are people that have been just uh, going and creating their own versions, uh, doing injection molding, but there have been some, some challenges. Uh, some of the challenges are, for example, in Spain, we are divided into several regions or states, however you want to call it, it could be equivalent to the states in the United States or the different regions or municipalities. And each one had a different requirement for the very same face mask. So we had like, even with the same design, they went to an hospital and they say, no, no, this hospital will not allow this because this doesn't comply to these rules. And then in another uh, area of the country, they would have like, yeah, this is okay. This is perfect. So it, it's very, <laughs> this has been quite complex. Also, there is this problem with logistics. We have no logistics and we expect as quarantine goes on to that people will start like having issues on delivering the actual uh, devices and products. Uh, so the, for us, it's not like trying to replace traditional industries or traditional products, but just create something that works as a temporary uh, solution. Regarding respirators, we had, uh, I, I'm doing a census of respirators in Spain and uh, there are like 37 respirator projects. I have in total covered like 56. Uh, so 37 are just from Spain. And last week we had a call uh, with the Spanish Agency of uh, Medicines. Uh, and this was an open call for anyone working on, on, on any of these projects. There were like 113 people uh, launching the questions live, like talking with the actual technicians in charge of certification process and validation of these devices. It was kind of, a, kind of a, it was also a Zoom conference like this one we are doing right now. Um, one of the uh, biggest, this has been even in the press today in, in Spain. And I'd say it like out of the 37 uh, prototypes, not all the prototypes are, are ready for action. I mean, there are some steps you need to cover. There are some steps you need to do. There are some uh, trials. And uh, so far from six to eight different uh, projects have completed this, these steps. So it was um, this, this process uh, or this project are moving forward. These are going to just uh, be able to, to advance further. And they are checking on, on how to scale, but not just on the manufacturing side, but also on how to scale on the on the other side. On how do we do we cover our legal aspects? How do we make sure that this is going to work? 
uh, and, and I think this is an kind of the open conversation that we are uh, having at this moment. Like, how do we, for example, Miguel Angel is going to talk about this whole conversation on 3D printed mask and why is it a good idea or a bad idea or how does how do you certify things like this for if if we focus on respirators uh, so far i'd like to share with you this document that has been released just to give you an overview of how how do they plan to do it at least in spain uh, i think that this cannot be translated to other places like this i know the fda has just released also uh, some information about how to do this. This is 17th of March from the Spanish. Uh, this is just in Spanish, but I will do like kind of live translation. Basically, they, they ask the project, okay, if you want this to be delivered in the hospitals, uh, we first need to know why are, what, what do you plan to use this for? How this is useful? Uh, please just write down, like, what are you trying to achieve? Who is going to be uh, your final user? Is it someone affected by COVID? Is it someone that has meal symptoms? Um, and they're like trying to say, to assess the risk. How are you trying to uh, uh, make sure that this doesn't break down and kills the people connected to the respirator? And how do you pr plan to, to set up an access? I, I'd like to clarify also that uh, in, the, in the very same meeting, there was a conversation about the, the standards because you know here there are these norms, technical norms like UNE, EN, ISO, whatever, uh, six. These are the actual uh, norms for the respirators. But one of the challenges is that some of the devices that have been showcased so far or that have been created uh, are not that complex, are more like mechanical, uh, uh, mechanical elements pressing the ambu or other elements. So they were like trying to propose like a, some kind of a lower requirement solution for this kind of project. So basically what they are asking the, the every respirator is, okay, first you go with the prototype, you write down what are your requirements, you prepare your paper, you are like, you say, okay, I, I think this device can support a person for 24 hours under mechanical ventilation. And then you need to do some trials with humans, uh, with, with human simulators, I mean, sorry, uh, or lung simulators. And then you need to validate the results with uh, animals, in this case with porks. So after you get all of this, you need to supply this to the agency. And then the way they, they plan to, to release these ventilators on the field is by allowing them to run under clinical trials. So they will ask the doctors just to say, okay, uh, what, what is your plan to try this device and to increase the size of the trial? So the very first thing, maybe you try with one, two patients, then five, then 10, then you kind of scale this kind of trial, maybe to another centers. But uh, in, in all the cases, this needs to pass the okay of the ethical committee of the hospital, because uh, one of the, even in the conversation, there were some really hard moments like, okay, I have, the, I have a good respirator and I have your custom made respirator. Should I just disconnect someone from the, from the professional respirator to try with yours? In which cases can this be used? What are the legal or the legal, requirement for us to do this. Uh, yeah, this is kind of the, the, the requirements. The trials are just just like write the documents so the doctor know how to use the machine or teach them how to use the machine, uh, specify what are your trials. And also one of the things that maybe caused was the least expected one was kind of electromagnetic trials in terms of make sure that your device is not going to interact with any other device on the intensive care unit. But the, the agency has offered like, okay, if you bring the prototype, I will just do this for you in one of our labs. So, so far, I think they are quite open to this idea of uh, having these ventilators under clinical trial and just uh, have this team like 
or support these teams. Uh, but yeah, there are like some minimums. And so far, I think this is the situation in Spain. I think this could open the, the floor to this conversation to see if this is overly complicated or if there should be like better alternatives or if the, to see if this is like uh, enough for, for this kind of trial. So I'm going to answer my screen. Okay, so we go back. Um, you know, think of destiny. Most people in the conversation is actually from Spain, <laughs> uh, except for maybe Marcos. Um, uh, but I think we should just uh, keep going um, anyway. I mean, we we all know how the situation is for for Sp the Spanish situation, where there's been this huge amount. This what I was talking about. There's been this huge amount of. Uh, of uh, ventilators being produced by a lot of people. I would be great, but we're streaming live in uh, <laughs> we're streaming live in English, so I think we should stick to English, <laughs> even though we should not be exclusive on this. It's it's been kind of hard to to keep people. The Americans wanted to go to talk technology instead. Uh, I guess it's a cultural thing to talk about. Uh, talk about the legal aspects, because I have to say also, it really feels that we are the very advanced level at this point. Uh, in Europe in general, there is a high level conversation with the commission about uh, how to accelerate this kind of innovation that comes from the grassroots and it's uh, being used in a field where until now was, we were not really allowed to innovate uh, because it was pretty complicated for, for a one man show to go in. And we've seen amazing collaborations between me medical uh, professionals and engineers at this point but i would like uh, everybody to just i mean everybody in now was in the previous session except for uh jose gomez and uh, and miguel angel that comes from the other panel so if you would like to just introduce yourselves briefly so we can uh, uh, open the floor to discuss afterwards so jose or miguel angel who wants to be first jose first okay oh miguel angel first <laughs> yeah. okay with me Please. Okay, so I introduce myself. I'm Miguel Angel. I'm, I'm working at the University of Barcelona and I'm coordinating the effort in from coronavirus makers in Spain uh, for uh, producing a mask that is basically uh, great for, created for, um, for an ER room. So basically in the, in the most hostile environment that, that still uh, is, is, uh, is basically providing a, a P3 uh, or even better uh, isolation and filtering. And so which are the challenges that you're facing from the homologation and legal aspects? Yeah, basically from the homologation aspect is uh, in, in, I'm, I'm not being all the, all in, in all the conversation about the respirator, but uh, basically there you have at least a compassive uh, way, you know? So basically in, at some point, if, if there is um, a, a decision that you need to do, either you use this machine or either you don't, and you die, then you, you would probably do it. This is not the case with a with a mask, because you don't see the effects in the moment. Uh, but uh, indeed, this is very important that we are developing uh, something in this in, in this direction, because uh, you don't see the, the 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 effects in the moment. But uh, all the all the emergency uh, staff will basically get more and more uh, ill, and will they won't be able to to assist other people. So this is very important that we address it. And uh, the, the problem is that since it is not so visible in that in that in that sense, it's not like a um, life or death matter, they they don't uh, easy the, the homologation process for, for them. Um, so basically, I know that in Spain, there are many, many companies that they are already ongoing on these homologations, but uh, they are really, really uh, lengthy and really difficult to, to pass. Um, and we are basically trying to 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 to, uh, to uh, raise awareness that we need also to easy the the process. Of course, not about the tests themselves. We need them. We need to to give the ER uh, room uh, staff something that is filtering indeed. Uh, but at least the bureaucratic steps could be. We, we don't need an homologation. We don't we don't want to commercialize anything at this point. What we want to do is basically to. To, to give them something. So if you don't want to call it homologation, call it validation, and then you easy some of some of the steps, 
keeping all the all the all the tests in the laboratory for for the safety, and and that's that's the the way that we are trying to go, trying to go. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Jose, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, Jose Gomez Marquez. Um, uh, I uh, uh, work at MIT. I have run a lab called Little Devices, and what we do is mash up a maker and health technology. We've been doing that for about 10 years. And then we also have a group called Maker Health, which was one of the first groups that um, in, in America was the first. We, we put maker spaces, medical maker spaces, inside the hospital. So that the hospital creates its own, its own devices uh, on an on-demand basis. Um, I've been paying attention, uh, and I have to say, it's kind of funny that uh, well, Caesar is responsible for bringing me in. And it's kind of funny that I think it's probably what three or four years ago that uh, David was in a in a in a talk that I randomly gave in Bilbao, and I, and and I, I said some controversial things about black boxes, and who knew that you know four years later we'd be having this conversation uh, in a in a real impactful way. Um, we've been paying so so we've been paying a lot of attention, and I I want to pick up on what uh, Miguel Angel says. Um, to just cut to the chase, we are making stuff in the hospitals. We are giving them to patients. It's it's actually helping patients. Um, I don't think we need homologation either. And this is very controversial, but I think that basically the moment that we took um, the, the, you know, the devices and then started to work with helpful companies, uh, this is what I've been observing and then what we've seen here that immediately grounds to a halt um, that says, well, we can help you scale this solution. Well, now you have a lot of liability actors, all, all interconnected. And it, it has, it, and it does slow things down, um, even though the, their, their ability to manufacture and scale is, is tremendous. But I, I don't think the traditional systems that we have are really prepared for this. They're changing rapidly. But I think at the end of the day, even with a simple, uh, on Monday, I think many of you, Cesar was helpful in printing it. You know, we made an X, it's an X, something that it's like, you know, and everybody thought that we were Richard Feynman. I said, no, this is an X, you know, it just does this. And it became like, it was on the news in Madrid. And it's because um, they're just not predicted. What, what, what we have shown that works and what we're doing, um, and I'll stop there, is the more traditional, more, you know, arts and crafts. No, it doesn't scale to a million, but I think we can get a million to make them. Basically, enabling the doctors and the nurses in, this, in the systems within the hospital to generate these devices, and then they fall under the practice of medicine. And then there is studies within the hospital of how to, how to essentially roll them out to the unit, even though it's within each institution. Um, because we know that the moment you launch it out, yes, you can do it under the guise of a, under, under the ages, not the guise, the ages of a, of a, of a clinical trial. I think that's really smart, um, but it immediately stops uh, adoption. And I think that the other thing that's gonna happen is we'll see a very spectrum of adoptions, right? Every, you know, you're, you're, America's gonna be the hardest because we have a very high liability um, culture of, of, of suing everybody. I think uh, Spain is right now being the example to the world. And I'm really eager to see what's gonna happen in, um, in Central and South America. I think that was a great opening for the conversation. So basically, as to set the ground, uh, we're looking at uh, the, the moral discussion on whether we should be using a device because we are in a life-threatening situation. <clears throat> and we know the device can also harm the person, but using it might be better than not using it. And, and I think this is, this is actually happening at every level. And that's why I, uh, I asked... Um, uh, Miguel Angel to join. Uh, Ignacio wants to, to speak as well. I will just give you the, the word in a second because he's not working with the ventilator. I mean, the ventilator is super clear, right? You're putting a, a pipe into somebody's throat, you're pumping air into this person's lungs, and uh, there is a strong potential of harming somebody if you pump air too quick. Uh, but Miguel Angel is looking at the opposite. It's like it's a, it's a medical professional going into the emergency room or internal care unit, and it's a highly toxic environment. And in its protection gear, 
Uh, and the conflict we have right now in many countries in Europe is that there is not enough protection gear. So the makers are making the protection gear, people are using it. And in Spain, actually, we have had a strong conflict because some regions have been approving the uh, 3D printed uh, protection gear, while some others have been saying this is not safe. And people keep on asking for it because they, it's better having this than having nothing, right? So this, this is really the kind of conflict we're here to discuss. But Ignacio, you wanted to say something, please open the microphone and uh, introduce your pitch. Yes, well, having, having uh, here uh, Jose, I, I fully agree with him uh, that uh, now the problem is more than homologation, is a problem of uh, people that are dying. So, uh, and we focus initially because, of course, uh, I, I have been uh, logically seeing all the developments from MIT. I was in 2007 there. And uh, in the first step, of course, we focus in the idea to develop something mechanical. Well, all the, all the gears around this kind of uh, ventilator, respirator, but we realize that the problem is, is not making something that it is mechanically uh, or, or something, the problem is not mechanical. The problem is that if you know or, or now has one people that could operate the AMBU, okay, that is, that is fair. Okay? You have one people that operate the AMBU, it looks that the patient is now breathing normally, so he can now stop or he can uh, uh, logically make the, the breathing more more uh, press uh, because the people is in not a very good situation. So at the end, the problem is how to make the AMBU work like a people works with the AMBU. And this was now the approach to use artificial intelligence, uh, so machine learning uh, to make kind of uh, approach like a people use the AMBU. Not approaching how uh, to make the AMBU works. Make the AMBU works. I use now this kind of approach of uh, the tensiometer, but uh, you can now think in one bag with another bag surrounded the first one and using the, the outside bag, uh, pushing air inside and then you can press the, the, the inside uh, bag with uh, a, a kind of pressure. So the idea is more than, than uh, develop one mechanical device, is develop a procedure uh, that can now work like a people. And uh, of course, if you have now MATLAB, reinforcement learning, all of these tools that normally I am using to develop uh, big uh, and complicated machinery uh, for learning uh, plants or industrial plants. So transposing that uh, to the ambience that you can now put this in kind of Arduino, this uh, model that you have uh, the 2860, and then using this Arduino to feed up uh, the, the AMBU, well, this is now approved by the, we can say the authorities, because at the end, AMBUs are approved. And the idea is to use AMBUs as, as a people will use or will now uh, make this AMBU works. Okay. <laughs> I have a, a question just for the for the, all, the, all the teams, and I think there is this this challenge right now. We were having this conversation at least uh, in terms of respirators, and I agree with Jose that that liability is one of the big questions. Like what what who is liable? And I'm also wondering with right now all these devices are quite complex. If you get a motor and the motor burns, it's quite clear maybe that the manufacturer give you a bad motor or you are using that in an unintentional way. But I'm wondering about, uh, given that we are talking about like legal and certification, I'm just wondering about the software part. Because for example, one of the things and, and challenges that was exposed in this meet in the morning was like, okay, we are thinking that uh, we have some features in the, in the ventilator 
but we can send you like maybe in one week time as uh, an upgrade and you can just change the software and it's going to be so we are facing this these more fluid times where the software can be like really changed in a really fast way. Like you were saying with reinforced learning, you can create these kind of loops uh, and start like uh, uh, improving the software, like not in a two years time, but in a weekly time. But what happens then with all the trials? Because one of the things that we got of the, uh, out of the meeting is you test a machine, with a software and then you keep the software like they're frozen forever because you tested the machine with a proper, we are all time now thinking about software defined behaviors. It's like Tesla just changes the, you upgrade the software, it, it improves the auto driving capabilities. But what happens with this kind of medical machines, at least we, I think it could be interesting to know your opinion right now when we are thinking about like improving really fast versus keeping it really safe. I don't know if this is a false dichotomy. And I also think Miguel Angel wants to talk. I don't know if this is related. So we can have several topics on. Just one, uh, one consideration I would like to do. Uh, Cesar, nice yeah. to meet you. Cesar, I like your beard and I'm becoming bald as you. So, uh, we think, uh, I don't know uh, uh, how much clinical engineering all you guys have knowledge about, but in the 1970s, uh, Air Force pilot developed the Mark 7 that was a completely mechanical ventilator. Uh, it's not r r well suited for the coronavirus. It's more suited for other kind of conditions. But if we manage to solve like 90% of the patients that need ventilation on a mechanical machine, like the one that I'm trying to build, uh, the software becomes a problem for the 10%, right? So I think one of the objectives that we have to, to try to maintain is um, kind of, uh, I cannot start my video again, sorry. Uh, is try to be objective on solving the bigger problem as fast as possible. So uh, as soon as we as we solve this for the major of the people, we can try to think about the others because the same problem that we solve for the 90% will be uh, like pre-solved when we embed the electronics on the machine. Uh, I understand your concern, Cesar, but uh, we have to like keep tight on the numbers because the numbers don't lie. Uh, the cases, the scenarios and the ages of the people. So of course, uh, old people is dying, but here in Brazil, 50% of the critical cases are on people between 18 and 40 years because it's a very, um, people live on very tiny houses and they have a lot of humidity. So uh, in these cases, I think that uh, the software has to work side by side. That's why we, we did like the Spartan and the Mark II version. We are work, work, working together. So once we release the Spartan, the Mark II has already all the hardware and mechanical needed to embed more technology on a reliable system that has over pressure control, PIP valve control, uh, breathing, inhalatory speeds and everything. Uh, Ignacio, I read a paper last, uh, like yesterday, or, because a lot of people is saying that we should uh, increase the ventilation frequency to uh, something like 200 BPM. I don't know if you heard about it. I don't know if you have clinical knowledge about that, uh, but I'm not sure that's a reliable uh, thing. But I, I, I thought you had some medical background. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, the idea is that uh, if you look to the solution uh, that uh, is implemented in this kind of reinforcement learning, a lot of the machines that has been implemented till now and has been uh, tested here in Spain, there is a, a very easy problem. Uh, you have now the machine running uh, and then the, the patient starts to cough. The machine yes. continues running. And yes. then the patient is at the same time having the breathing from the machine and the cough. So it's 
classically a very big problem. So yes, we, we solved that with valves. We had a diverting valve. We have four inlets. And when the pressure is positive on the patient side, it closes all the valves and send it to the expiratory valve. Uh, uh, so this is a, a design of Ethan Moses. He has a YouTube channel. He heard about our project and joined forces with us. But I would like to ask, uh, first of all, uh, well, first Miguel has, uh, the, he was raising his hand, has something to say. Uh, but at some point, I would also like to hear about, I mean, besides which is your political stand, uh, Marcos, regarding your view on, okay, we have to do this yes or yes, because there is no options. These are the numbers. I also would like to hear which are the regulatory bodies in, in Brazil, right? That would be very interesting to know uh, okay. to, to, to get like the, the, official, the official line, because I also know, for example, that people from Resistencia, they are considering exporting their project to other to other places and uh, and they're trying to, to try to follow the same kind of level of uh, safety and regulations that they try to do in Spain so they want to advise people at other places so they can also you know make the trials uh, so what, what's the legal aspect there in Brazil yeah so uh, Brazil is a third world country we are pretty shitty like on health uh, the company of uh, that I work, we fix hospital equipment, uh, everything on hospitals, because normally hospitals have 15, 20 year old equipment. So I have a, a little bit of background on that. Uh, the regulatory agency here, like two weeks ago, released a notice saying, look guys, uh, China is not exporting to us. United States is buying everything they have. Uh, we don't have like a very strong, uh, like manufacturing plants here that can produce on, like uh, on the on the um, on the rate that we need to rate. So we are removing all the. So you can now in Brazil for 180 days you can import any medical equipment and any uh, medicine even if it's not regulated, even if it if it's for testing purposes because. Uh, on the point of view of the Brazilian government, as I can see on this paper, they assume that, okay, we cannot solve, if we keep the bureaucracy, we are gonna kill more people than if we uh, doesn't have the, like the, these rules so fast. And so um, they released a paper saying, look, we have to solve this like for yesterday. The, we have infections coming up this week and, um, and I can send you the, the notice. It's even on our GitHub page. Yeah, please. Yes. Uh, based on the chat, people are very interested in the conversation. Actually, a couple of questions came up. I will bring them up before we continue with Miguel and Jose. Uh, uh, Bernham is the nickname. Said, uh, my background is medical device engineering. I have successfully submitted software systems for, uh, to FDA. On the question of software verification in updates, the 62,304 standard is clear about identifying software risk and verification that needs to happen. In the US, as long as the software updates uh, does not increase or add new risk, it can be updated without regulatory concern, but still needs to be verified at software level and at least a subset of affected systems testing each update. So this is something that we brought up in Spain as well because uh, during the meeting we had last Monday with regulatory bodies, people asked and uh, they said, no, when you submit a machine, the machine is closed. There's like no chance you can be updating software. You know, uh, that then you need to repeat the whole testing again. And there is another note from uh, Caleb and he says, our problem in the US is that without some kind of approval or certification, the medical professionals will just not use devices. And this is fair. Is there any knowledge or understanding of whether the uh, EAU process that, uh, that the FDA has introduced is a viable way to get a ventilator design approved quickly and how quickly is quickly expected to be? So this is kind of in line with what happens in Spain again, where uh, it's the same thing as in Brazil. They remove regulation, uh, the normal regulation, and they said we create this like speed up line, but it will never be hom homologated. So it will only be considered a medical trial, which means... Exactly. Uh, after after the emergency expires, your device is not valid no more. Exactly. Uh, uh, yeah. 
Wait, I think next one uh, was Miguel. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, because this is evolving and evolving, but my, my question is from, from before, uh, from Jose Gomez. Uh, so basically, I, I, I think that for some equipment, for some safety gear, like for example, the face shield, uh, I agree totally with the, with the fact that we should leave in the hands of the, of the physicians if they see it right or not to use it, no? Uh, it, it's good that we, we make an effort to, to make it really strong and really reliable, but in the end, uh, all the all the regulations and all the validations and all the homologations on that, uh, it's, it's a little bit over overkill. But on the, for, for example, on, on, the, on what I'm working with, the, the, the masks for ER room staff, where basically if you don't give the 100%, then you are basically uh, making sure that all of them are going to get at some point ill. Uh, you need to pass some, at least the, the basic steps. Uh, you, you need to, to provide all these tests in, in, in the laboratory. And what I say is that uh, we should have only those and we should really go like direct to the point in, in, in that sense. Uh, I wouldn't leave on the hands of the physician to, to, to decide on, on the GR itself, at least um, referring to the, to the masks. Uh, I would really do the tests all the way um, and yeah that's it so jose yes do you okay have the floor? just i feel we're in fifth grade but this is working um uh absolutely i no i agree i'm not saying that you know you can ask caesar when he first invited me to the whatsapp and everything was like we're all going to make a ventilator i told i told caesar you know, you're going to not like me anymore because I think it's crazy for that, for, for, because I think these things matter, right? And I think we've seen a lot of crap out there too, which is, which is the scary part. Okay, so regarding masks, um, I just put a, a link in, in Cedar Rapids, it's a hospital that, one of the hospitals that we work with, they made a mask, but more importantly, we also consulted and created a protocol to validate the mask within the hospital. And so I called a bunch of people, you know, everything from like, we know the virus is like 0.3 microns. Do we have to filter the, mic the, the virus? No, because the virus doesn't live on its own. It lives in, in mucus and the mucus is three microns. So that sort of stuff. We had a lot of conversations about that and really created a protocol of how to validate it. And what's interesting that I'm hearing from this conversation is that this wonderful community defeated the black box, but now the new black box is how do we how do we navigate this regulatory and validation step? Uh, I think in Spain, they're being a lot more transparent. I think in Brazil, it's very Brazilian of you, which is amazing. Um, in America, it is still a black box. Yes, there's a website in the FDA, but it just says, I mean, if you go to it, it just, it's, it's really up in the air. You really have no idea, like, do I need five pigs? Do I need 10 pigs? Um, that sort of stuff. Um, the, the, the other thing that I wanted to just point out, so, so we believe in validation. I just think that there's a, there, there's a subtle difference in, 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 in how do you democratize that validation. The other thing that I wanted to, to jump on, because I don't think we answered Cesar's original concern about software and how that gets updated and stuff like that. I think that there's a, uh, there's a very good case study in the Project Night Scout, and I'm not going to go on too long about it because you guys can Google it. But Project Night Scout basically created a software mechanism to monitor um, type one diabetes glucose users, which are really difficult and very risky, okay? And they just did it. Just like you, like, just like everybody here is essentially making a device. Um, they weren't selling it. It literally had a Facebook group and they took it to the FDA to basically do largely what we're trying to do is saying, okay, what do we do now? And to this day, the FDA said, well, who is the officer of the company? And, and, and the people in charge were like, no, we have a Facebook, a Facebook group. But, you know, um, and to this day, the FDA can't do anything about it because they cannot regulate something that is not sold. That is true. That is if for the same reason that you see in the senior citizen homes in Spain and here in Boston, a bunch of walkers with sliced tennis balls, nobody regulates that crap. Okay? It is you because it's a, it, and what we call that is a hardware protocol. It's the same reason that neither the FDA in America or the, I don't know what it's called in Spain, uh, I should, because we're working there now, 
Um, when you make a cast, okay, when you get when 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 you were a little kid and, and you broke your arm, they don't regulate the plaster. It's plaster, and they don't it because you make the cast. So I think that's why you see my bias against mass manufacturing. Because if we stay by democratizing these things, then we can still fly under the radar and still be ethical, obviously, um, about these things. Um, but but I think that I put the GitHub because now that project has more than, I think almost, well, 5,000 commits, but more importantly, I think it has more than 4,000 users around the globe. Um, and it's an example of what happens when you truly democratize these processes. And, and we're, we are gonna make some people upset. And you know what? Some biomedical engineers are tearing their hair out right now. Some clinical engineers are tearing their hair out right now because they recognize that they studied seven years biomedical engineering. And I'm, I'm not working on ventilators, but you are. And, um, and everybody just did it in two weeks. So it is a moment that people are not accustomed to. I think we just need to pay attention to how do we, how, again, how do we, how do we validate within the clinic and, and then just multiply those clinics? Stop right there, David. I, I just for, for, for completion, for, for completing the, the information here, uh, I, I, I had a chat today with, uh, with one of the heads in, the, in Andalusia. And basically, uh, that's that that basically will um, uh, sorry to summarize why I'm going so so hard in in having all the tests and not only the clinical tests but also also in the laboratory like really testing the filtration uh, that you are doing and and this is the the following uh, so far it's true it's, it's basically not even not even in the in the medical um, society uh, there is a uh, true um, agreement on, on how is uh, or what is the, the route that you are getting more ill and and the problem is uh, that in for, for normal use like for a policeman or for a, for any 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 people that is out uh, usually everything every, every piece of the gear like the one that I just check that you are doing in the, in, in the, 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 the face mask you know, that, that you are you had in the YouTube uh, link that's that's already enough. But the problem is, and he was telling me, like, Miguel, do you think that the, the viruses are uh, still um, uh, in suspension? And, and of course, from a physicist's point of view, I'm a physicist, from a physicist's point of view, they are. And they are living there for some hours. And they, they, there is a, there is a well, let, let me finish and, and I will try to. So in the, in, in the end is that if you are in an ear room, uh, you will get more and more of this. So it, you are putting more and more of this uh, all the time. So there is a moment in which also you need to consider the, the viruses in suspension. So in that specific so hostile uh, room, and it's kind of like you, you should really think about it, like you are really in front like two centimeters of a very ill person. And in that specific uh, scenario, you really need to, to, to go uh, to the lab and to test all the gear. What I say is, again, bureaucracy out, only tests. Um, but just to say, uh, when, when I was telling him that I did the maths, and, and, and you can see that really the virus stays there and can be inactivated really quick and so, but you are inputting more and more from new, from the, from the patients. Um, and, and then he told me, like, you know what? That makes sense because we are implementing a very harsh uh, cleaning procedure on all the all the health workers, and still we got ten thousand of them ill in, in 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 the house, and that only can be explained with this. So I'm, I'm I don't know maybe I'm overkilling it, uh, but I think that we should at least for the uh, for, for the masks for the year room we should really do all the tests and not only to give it to the to, to the clinical tests. I think this goes to the, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no. Do you want Jose to go ahead? I, I was going to, to add some part to that, but I think it's uh, one of the things we we just discover the, just by checking how this is evolving. One of the most uh, mediatic projects so far has been this kind of mask with Decathlon or other brands. These are snorkel masks where you get like the snorkel mask with some kind of intakes, uh, outtakes for the air. And one of the challenges we, we found is that initially this piece was released to, for patients, for patients that were 
laying there that needed some extra oxygen. And the 3D printed piece allowed it to connect just to the flow of air coming to the room and to the filtration system. But one of the things we discovered uh, the other day in a call is when we are thinking about solutions and, and scenarios, we have to think about who is the final user. What, where, what is the environment that this is going to be used for? Because one of the things we have discovered is that, for example, now some, some doctors are using the decathlon mask, using some HMA like uh, filters right there in the intake and the outtake. And we got the, we were in the group with some specialists in, the, in uh, additive manufacturing and lab trials to verify how things uh, really work. And, and he said, we have been doing trials in the lab and from a scale from zero to 100, the, the snorkel mask gets a rating of five out, out of 100 for the face shield. So even if the, the, the face mask looks like super sturdy and feels like this, it could take everything out of the ambient for you, it's like you will get the virus from the shields. And even if you think about it, the given that you are going to be snorkeling, you cannot put safety glasses there or you cannot wear any mask comfortably inside. So by not specifying where or who can use what solution where, we are creating maybe some chances for people to get uh, infected. So uh, I, I go to the, to the point of, of Miguel Angel like, it's really critical just to just to share the information, not just about the device, but who is the final user, who can benefit from this, and who who not. Because with ventilators, it's the same. We have seen so many ambus and so many, but with the ambus, so far the doctors I've been talking to, they say, okay, you cannot keep more than twenty-four hours someone with an ambu. So even if we think, okay, this device can help someone. Yeah, maybe for six, eight, ten hours, but not for two weeks. And and again, I think this is all we are like creating something that wasn't there before. That is some kind of layer approach. We, because we, if you have like high class ventilators, everyone gets a high class ventilator. But when there is a shortage, we still need to think what are the cases or what are the scenarios where this particular device can be helpful. And this is part of the conversation, like setting up who is the final users, who benefits from that, and out of all the possible uses for the device, where these have been tested, actually. So I think you wanted to talk, uh, yeah. Yeah, just briefly. Um, I, I absolutely, I think that um, the, for, regarding masks, um, absolutely, I think we have to do the test. We have to do, you know, at the beginning, we, we, we consulted with some folks at the Harvard School of Public Health that do bioaerosols. Bio and so that's where we got our guidance. And the, the, what we learned, for instance, not to get too technical, because I know this is not the point of the tech, this is not a technical talk. Um, you know, we said that the fit is really important, less the filter. And so we focused on the fit. Um, and that's why you saw me get up. We ended up using these guys. Um, so this is what... Um, you know, uh, I don't know, I, we don't use them, but Cesar, if you and I went to like uh, the Oscars, you know, if I wanted to make sure that my, my, my uh, gown didn't, uh, didn't slip, I put it here and it stays in place. So okay. it's double-sided tape. And so that way I can, um, I can put it on my, you know, put over here and then, um, you know, you know, and it's stuck. Okay. so. Um, uh, but so, so we, we did that and then we challenged. And then our initial question was, do I need to use, for instance, a ca an Anderson cascade impactor and create like a two chamber thing with barrel cells on one side, attack it with a virus? What's then an easy virus to a cat? Can I, can I use lentivirus or something like that? So we asked those, a lot of those questions. Our, our, our expert folks told us, just do a fit test. If you can do a fit test, we know you're filtering most of it. But I think that we, if, we, if we needed to do the other more biological test, there is absolutely no reason why we can't and we shouldn't. But it is important for the community to understand that when people say you need to do these tests, 
you know, it's not that hard. Like we can do this. We can, you know, if, 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 if we can grow beer in our basement, we can do these types of tests in a safe manner. And the problem is sharing that knowledge just as much as the way we're sharing the, the 3D printed examples. Um, so I fully concur about, 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 about the importance of, of, of testing. Yeah. I don't know if you are aware, Jose, that one of the things that when, when you, we, we have been talking about black boxes and regulatory stuff. And one of the things that just, well, I, I don't know if I would say surprised me the most is that after this kind of uh, pandemic started spreading, some of the black boxes have opened, at least in a temporary manner. Like, for example, there were some papers released uh -huh. that were like, there is a collection of 2000 papers that just were available for the academics. Now they're open so everyone can get to find solutions. But also here in, in Europe, I don't know if it came just from the European level or the Spanish level. We also got some, uh, the, the UNA norms to build uh, the equipment for personal protection are open right now. So anyone can get to read the papers on what is tested, what are the trials. And I'm, this is kind of a paradoxical situation because we, we already have some tests and ready some protocols for trial, but you kind of have to pay for that. And it's kind of just for some people that are really specialists. But when there is the real need, then it's open. Like, oh, we have the need and you can consult every kind of legal text. So there is this uh, right now. Uh, also, I learned uh, today, for example, that uh, under the patent law, at least uh, I don't know if this is unified, but at least in Spain, Article 66 of the patent law specifies that you cannot keep a patent if that attends against public health. So in, in this particular scenario, even the law is providing us tools, like if you're in, in such a need, uh, you can just go ahead and, and use this. So I, I'm just wondering how does it look like for the after uh, coronavirus world? Because so far everyone is like, okay, we need to do things. We need to uh, change the way that things are done. And we are breaking a lot of barriers. So a lot of, I, I know say that we as, as we are, but most institutions, most, bo most bodies that have kept the knowledge under some kind of uh, world garden or world uh, um, uh, way are opening that up to solve the changes. And I was thinking, if I'm thinking about the future that we are thinking about climate change or other kind of long-term scenarios, um, how, how could this current situation affect the availability and access to to the means just to get the knowledge required to change things. And maybe this is kind of a prototype itself of how things can change to provide us the tools and provide us the, the ways to, to break down the boxes and build things in a different way. I, I wanna virtually raise my hand for real because I, I, I don't have that tool in the, in the system so I cannot raise the hand. So I have to actually, because I'm the host, I have to interrupt the, the conversation. First, uh, Marcos, uh, he said he needs to leave because he needs to test some valves. So, uh, yes. so I want to thank you, Marcos, for your presence today. Da David, just complimenting what Cesar said. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, just, uh, before I go, uh, okay. so here in Brazil, uh, the government says, if you want to sell a medicine here, you have to show the recipe. So the government explicit says to buyer, for example, uh, okay, you want to get inside, but the government will produce the same medicine that you produce and be your rival on the market, right? This is awesome because in Brazil, we have very cheap medicine, for example, for diabetes, and the government gives it for free for everyone. So Caesar, one, uh, like a week ago, a journalist called me and on a very philosophical way of thinking, I love philosophy. He told, he asked me, Marcos, isn't the coronavirus the test proof that we needed to the humanity to say that capitalism doesn't work for saving lives and for maintaining a minimal standard of living for everyone? And I said, yeah, because when the, a situation like that happened, what a normal liberalism would say is, 
world, we have a high demand, companies will start manufacturing like on a very high rhythm and everyone will be happy with a cheap ventilator. And that's not how things work because normal ventilators use almost handcraft made valves. Uh, the thing I, 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 and I worried about, as you said, about the future of our world after these black boxes are open uh, and all these people open these black boxes uh, and a lot of manufacturers of ventilators open it, but we cannot build them. That's why they open. Because if they could build it, they were profiting right now. So uh, they, they open it because if you find a way to solve the valve equation in the, in the pneumatic system, uh, solve it, you know, it's free for use. It's not, it's not useful for me right now. And, and it's very noble to open on a, this kind of situation. The, about uh, Jose Gomez Marquez, uh, the Argentina guys that are working with me, they solved the problem of the masks for the doctors and the nurses, building a suit made of plastic, like, a, I don't know, like a bag of plastic. And they put positive pressure like a, a aerospace suit. So the air is out. If you punch with a needle or something, the air is always out. And uh, they are prototyping this like in a few weeks. It has a very, very tiny motor on the back. You use some batteries, LiPo batteries, and uh, they keep air flowing in all the time inside the suit, but the air flows through a filter that also the Argentina government kind of the N95 standard from 3M, uh, they are not exporting anymore. So they made, made a latex polymer uh, with some very complex chemistry that I don't understand because I don't have the chemistry base. But this is a latex polymer that can filter like 0 0.3 micro. So it's very good. And the another good stuff is that the polymer has a molecule alignment or something like that, that keeps a very high airflow. It's very uh, interesting. This is public knowledge on the universities of Argentina. Uh, Washington, the guys that working with me can give you the pass off the rocks to this kind of system is scalable, buildable, very easy to do. And, uh, um, and you only take a suit with uh, like a plastic suit and it keeps like pumping air inside. And you have a transparent uh, thing to, to see out. And it's a very, very clever idea. And um, I can put you in contact with them. Sorry, I have to leave. I really, really have to thank everyone. I have to go to the lab testing the valves. And, um, and some meetings with Ethan and all the guys. Thank you very much for the opportunity of you all guys. And I hope that we are united in this situation because it's a global cause and it's not regional. Yeah, thanks Marcos, keep in touch. You know where to find all of us. So I, um, I mean, we're 10 minutes to go to the end. So I really would like to give the opportunity to uh, some other people to talk. I want to remind you that we spoke about a lot of things in the end. Uh, we spoke about the responsibility of programming something with a software that is uh, machine learning based. So how would that behave? We spoke about the black boxes being open because of the circumstances, the legal limitations being put down. And I have to say that uh, the other day talking to the director of the Agency of Innovation in Spain, he was saying we made in 10 days the innovation that it took 10 years to make before. And uh, it's pretty interesting. Ignacio mentioned something on the chat that was pretty good as well. He said that in the States, everything is allowed until they tell you not to do it. In Europe, everything is forbidden until you get the permission to do it. So it's also an interesting, an interesting thing. And I think that's actually pretty much of a capitalist approach to regulation. Um, Marcos brought a very political view as well to the conversation. And, uh, but I really would like to, to have a couple of minutes for David to explain us uh, how was their experience on Resistencia with the actual process of testing uh, all, of, and all of the legal aspects they faced? Uh, uh, because everything, like the, the legal aspect itself was a black box. So it's not like opening an existing machine was a black box, but the legal aspect was very obscure. Uh, and they had to like fight all the time trying to get through different places to, to get um, just the regulation on what they had to test. So this is the <laughs> this is the complexity of the problem. So David, can, can you say a few words about that? Yeah, sure. 
David, you're very silent. We can barely hear you. So maybe you, you can check. Sorry, sound. sorry, sorry. My microphone was down. Uh, was up. Sorry. So I am not uh, into in in all the details, but I can tell you uh, that uh, when I enter the this this uh, this this group, this collaboration group, this this team. Uh, they have already they had already contacted a lot of uh, doctors uh, they had a lot of information they they had um, uh, like uh, a guide of the the things to comply that uh, they need uh, for 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 this approach to 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 have a real good ventilator for critical cases of coronavirus and also they have contacted uh, uh the the organisms that can give you this uh, approval this kind of uh, emergency certificate but uh yeah we we face uh, a lot of um, political problems like uh, everyone wants to to have a like a medal like uh, this is be, this has been certified uh, in my area or so and also, we have, we have uh, people making press, uh, making us this certification more difficult because they they have uh, uh, economic interests, like they work in the regular industry. That is okay, but uh, for me, and not for me only, I, I am a, <laughs> I am a believer in in gold. But all the team, they 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 see this. This is a miracle to have this uh, going through. It's incredible. Anyway, uh, political pressure, like uh, mm, me media pressure, is uh, of a lot of help because when people see you have a solution, or or you almost have it, but you have a solution, uh, and you only need the approval, this is a lot of pressure for political uh, class, for the political class. So they are they are going to move. As fast as possible, and make the things as easy as possible, so that they don't, don't, don't they are not uh, blamed for all these people dying. If you know what I mean. So uh, we have to use that a little bit in our favor. Favor. We have to, on one hand, do a very good uh, machine because this is for saving people, not for making the problem worse, but uh, we have faced uh, that. that uh, uh, the truth is, we have to use a bit of uh, media pressure to to get it through. And also, the protocols are not not clear. Sometimes we had a protocol, we followed it, uh, and now, please, uh, can you up? Can you add this and this? Uh, well, we can. We can do a more complex machine. We, yes, we can. But uh, you ask. Uh, you ask our team to meet these and these and these uh, uh, goals, and we have already achieved this and more. So uh, this is why we have been passing through several different tests te uh, tests with animals. The first one was with a healthy uh, pig, and it was great. The certificator was amazed on of of the achievements. He was expecting a very, very easy machine with not too much uh, controls and sophistication, but but uh, it was not enough. We meet that it was not enough. So now we have uh, tested it with uh, the the more difficult conditions you can find in this uh, uh, this illness, and uh, we we are in the latest steps of this uh, certification. So. Uh, what what else can can I do? Uh, can I say? Um, well, um, well, I don't know. <laughs> if there's any question? Or... I I am not the the more most no, expert that, in this you. area. I think, I think you gave a really good picture of what happened. Uh, so yeah. I, I think this is the other thing, right? It's like because we're distributed community right now, and this is something that Jose was mentioning earlier. We have distributed responsibility. And right. that is a really powerful tool uh, as well. Like uh, uh, 
uh, this uh, also Jorge Jorge Barrera from Cotec was mentioning this very same thing the other day. It's like it's really hard to certify a machine by a non-existing entity. <laughs> So That's you have a bunch right of people too. that join together because they really wanted to help. They make this thing. And how are they supposed, who's signing papers? Uh, you know, who's legally responsible? Who's going to the ethical committee? Who's paying the bills? And, and um, it's, it's really hard. But we're, we're forgetting that we are actually building society and we should be also having the right to do some of these things. And, and maybe it's time to question uh, some of the existing regulations. Maybe the Industrial Revolution, the fourth Industrial Revolution is this. I know what they mm -hmm. told us about 3D printing cats and boxes, <laughs> you know? I think, Jose, you wanted to say something? Yeah, no, I just, to, to jump on that point, again, I, I think that this is really uncharted territory. I'm really proud of being Spanish right now because every, I'm really sad that I'm here, honestly. I, if I could catch a plane, I would go there, but then I would die from my wife killing me. Um, but, but let's remember, like in the civil war, right? Doctors in Barcelona it practically invented mobile uh, blood transfusion and, and they just did it. You know, they did it ethically and they did it responsibly. Um, but I think public pressure is going to continue to increase. And um, I, I, I think that that's, I think that that distributed aspect and, and as long as we're being very transparent about these things, it's going to be harder for the bureaucrats to get in the way um, and to instead be useful, you know, to, to go down to the granular thing of saying that I, I was just asking David, like, how many animals do you need to test? What do this look like? Instead of just saying, well, you should know this. No, nobody should know this. We all jumped in on this because we wanted to help because the Medtronic of the world were not solving this, you know, and open sourcing plans, by the way, that nobody understands how to actually make them doesn't really count in my book. Um, and, and I'm not a big open sourcer, but you guys know more about that than I do. So um, I think we can take advantage of that. So I'm, I'm excited. And also please use the, us as a resource. We're on the other side um, and, and we can share as we learn as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think I'm gonna take the opportunity to close the meeting right now. If anybody wants to say some final words, uh, this is your chance. Uh, I think Jose I think made a, a great pitch to close. <laughs> by yeah, the way. yeah. Uh, I think we have the chance right now to start. Like, uh, maybe we will have now. Now each of us are in our homes, and now we, I think we have a time to reflect in a way, but also to to see what worked, what didn't work, and to share this knowledge and to keep it like some something we treasure together. Like, oh, we learned so much in in three weeks, in one month mm -hmm. that. I, I think this is something that we'll keep like for a long time after we go out again to the streets and and it's, maybe okay. this is some temporary, but we'll go on. I, I hope that this will not stop here. Uh, it's been it's been an amazing um, it's been an amazing couple of weeks. Uh, have to say. Um, uh, we didn't really mention, but Tasha and I have been involved. You can see we have really been sleeping a lot. We we got engaged very early on in basically distilling information from the Spanish communities and publishing summaries. And very, very quickly, we ended up being among some of the organizers of some of the small aspects within the community, fundraising, logistics, or whatever. Um, at this point, I think we learned uh, really a lot. And I hope I do have a strong belief that we are the, the elephant that comes in the porcelain store and we break a lot of stuff, but in the end, we actually open the door at the end so everybody can go through, you know? So, so we've been that body. And, and um, uh, there's been like these three approaches and I think they were mentioned throughout the talk. The approach number one, it has always been governments have the power to obtain equipment and they buy it somehow. Approach number two is Governments push companies into open sourcing their machinery and they try to copy it, but then there's a supply chain problem. Approach number three is we come in, we fix things. It's not that we know better, but we have this ingenuity that will eventually help us find something really good that will help us fix problems that nobody thought about fixing before in that way. So I want to, want to thank you all very much. Uh, this conversation has been recorded so you can follow it online. This was the Arduino COVID-19 conference. 
you're all welcome to um, to uh, follow, uh, check the video online. And if you miss the other two panels, they are all recorded and they will be uploaded to YouTube very soon. So you can watch them as well. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, everyone.